Okay, hello and welcome to the Ohio Crisis Academy, Roadmap to the Ideal Crisis System and How it Applies to Ohio. I'm Courtney Ebersall and I'm with the Ohio Association of County Behavioral Health Authorities. Before we get started, I wanna provide a few housekeeping items. We're using Zoom webinar today, which means that attendees cannot use their microphones or videos. The chat function is also disabled for you today. While the panelists and I can send you information through the chat, you will not be able to respond. If you have a question that pops up as you are listening to the presenters, please feel free to add that question to the Q&A box. Please keep your questions related to the content and topics we're learning about today. If you have any technical difficulties throughout this training, please contact me. I will post my email in the chat box momentarily. This training has been approved for 2.75 hours of continuing education credit for the following disciplines. Nurses, social workers, mental health counselors, prevention professionals, chemical dependency counselors, and psychologists. For CE credit, you must be signed in from your own device under your own name. By logging on to the training, we'll be able to track your attendance. If you log out early, we'll adjust your certificate to the amount in which you participated. After the training, I will send an email that includes a SurveyMonkey link that will allow you to evaluate the training. You must complete this evaluation in order to receive CE credit. Please be sure to provide your license number in the evaluation. Your CE certificate will be emailed to you within two weeks. Certificates of attendance are available upon request. Today's Crisis Academy will be recorded and available on OMAS's Crisis Services webpage within the next few weeks. The PowerPoint slides will also be posted to the website. And now I will turn it over to Ohio MAS Director Lori Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I wanna to welcome you to the Ohio Crisis Academy. And today's topic is the Roadmap to the Ideal Crisis System, which is a publication that was uh, released over uh, recently. And um, we're looking at how it applies to the Ohio system. So we're very excited for today's guests and wanna give a little background to this academy and to our work at the department. Similar to physical health crisis, a mental health or addiction crisis can be devastating for the individuals, families, and communities who are experiencing them. And across Ohio, people of all ages and their families are seeking care in record numbers. While we're unable to fully predict when a crisis will happen, we can be intentional with how we plan for systems and services designed to meet the needs of those experiencing a crisis. The Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and its partners are working to develop a supported quality response system to serve as a timely and appropriate alternative to arrest, incarceration, unnecessary hospitalization, or placement in a setting without the ability to address the acute nature of the situation a person is experiencing. Governor DeWine's fiscal year 2021 operating and budget included a focus on developing standardized and quality crisis access in communities across the state to act as an appropriate alternative to arrest or emergency department visits. These funds increased the number of crisis stabilization centers in Ohio and expanded access to services such as withdrawal management, and the funds reduced the need for psychiatric hospitalization and increased local collaboration. Ohio is planning in the new budget that will begin later this week to continue this great work. In addition, Governor Mike DeWine commissioned the Recovery Ohio Initiative to coordinate the work of state departments, boards, and commissions by leveraging Ohio's existing resources and seeking new opportunities in a collaborative way. The Recovery Ohio Advisory Council included recommendations related to supporting people in crisis in their initial report. The department's vision is for every Ohioan to have access to a visible and accessible crisis continuum of services and supports. We want these to be person-centered, quality-driven, and focused on ensuring that people are stabilized and then thriving in community after crisis. Ohio envisions a compassionate and competent system of statewide crisis services that are consistent with SAMHSA's values of safety for everyone, active engagement of the person who is in crisis, holistic treatment, recovery, resilience, and natural supports. The quality crisis services system provides needed assistance to Ohioans and their families 
before an emergency occurs, rapidly responds to and stabilizes a person while they're experiencing a crisis, and makes strong connections to community-based treatment services and supports as the crisis resolves. Ohio's crisis response system has four priorities, connect, respond, stabilize, and thrive. Every Ohioan in crisis deserves to have a place to call or connect to crisis response, a system of response that responds, whether that's a mobile response that goes to a person or a place-based response where a person, families, communities can go if they're in crisis. Services that help resolve the crisis and stabilize the person in that uh, acute situation. And then a system of support that's designed to disrupt the cycle of crisis that really allows Ohioans to thrive in their communities. The roadmap to the ideal crisis system is what we'll be talking today about today. And it was co-authored by members of the Committee on Psychiatry in the Community and by the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry. It was published by the National Council for Behavioral Health. We are grateful to have three distinguished members of this team with us today to discuss the roadmap and to help us make connections to its application in Ohio. So I would like to welcome Dr. Kenneth Minkoff, who's the Senior Systems Consultant with Zia Partners, Dr. Marjorie Balfour, who's the Chief of Quality and Clinical Innovation with Connections Health Solutions, and Ohio's own Dr. Mark Munitz, who's a professor and chair emeritus, Department of Psychiatry at Northeast Ohio Medical University. Before they begin, let me introduce Alicia Clark, our Assistant Director of Community Planning and Collaboration at the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. She'll help frame today's conversation. Thank you, Director Chris, for your leadership and commitment to developing a quality crisis response system that will meet the needs of Ohioans. Good afternoon, everyone. As the director mentioned, I'm Alicia Clark, and I'm the Assistant Director of Community Planning and Collaboration, and I am the department's crisis lead. As a part of Ohio's Crisis Learning Collaborative, the department introduced several tools to assist with supporting planning for a quality crisis response system with the goals that include expand learning and crisis planning opportunities for local communities and developing resources and programs intended to support access to crisis services. The Crisis Academy is just one of those tools designed to develop opportunities for shared learning across the state. We cannot do this work alone in collaboration with the Ohio Council, OACPA, Adam H. Boards, Providers, and the PEGS Foundation, we have successfully hosted six crisis academies, and today is our seventh. Today, we will have a moderated presentation on the roadmap to the ideal crisis system. Our moderator for today's discussion is Rick Keller, president of the PEGS Foundation. Rick Keller holds a Master's of, Bachelor, a Masters of Business Administration he is the president, as I said, of the PEGS Foundation, a position he's, he's held since 2005. Born out of personal experience, Mr. Kellers challenges the status quo, pursuing improvements in access to behavioral health, education, and the arts, believing Akron and Ohio can serve as a template for the nation inspiring others to think bigger. Prior to the foundation, he spent 28 years in the U.S. Army, including service in the Infantry and Special Forces, the Green Berets. His work included a variety of leadership positions at the Joint Special Operations Command and at the Pentagon as the Director of Resourcing for the United States Army Operations and Readiness Initiative. Mr. Keller has served on the Talmadge School Board since 2005 and currently serves as the President. He is a graduate of the Leadership Akron class, serves on the LeBron Community Advisory Board, the Summit County Addictions Leadership Council, the Kennedy Forum National Parity Leadership Work Group, and as advisor to the Cent Center for High Impact Philanthropy at the University of Pennsylvania. We wanna thank him, thank Mr. Keller for moderating today. And the next voice you'll hear is Mr. Rick Keller. Thank you very much, Alicia. I appreciate it. And, um... 
I think all of my all of my background just tells it's like I try and do everything that's easy, right, Ken? I saw you laughing as on on back backstage here, and uh, it's funny because now we're going to figure out how to how to handle crisis services in, in Ohio from the community up and from the state down. So no no, no easy task in front of us. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ken Minkoff. Um, as Director Chris mentioned earlier, um, he is a board certified addiction psychiatrist and senior system consultant at Zia Partners, as well as a part-time assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He's recognized as one of the most preeminent experts on integrated services and systems for individuals with co-occurring serious mental illness and substance use disorders. For over 40 years, he's worked to develop services and systems with limited resources to best meet the needs and inspire the hopes of individuals, families, and populations with the greatest challenges. In that journey, he's been involved in service provision, management, and consultation in almost every aspect of behavioral health. Dr. Minkoff has worked with his consulting partner to provide systems consultation on the state, county, and tribal level in over 40 states, including 15 California counties, resulting in extensive firsthand knowledge of the strengths and challenges of multiple state and county systems across the nation. He's also worked in seven Canadian provinces and four states in Australia. He's worked with complex systems and populations, developing tools and approaches, policy and funding direction, and measurement and improvement strategies to address state, local, and national implementation of services that leverage available resources most efficiently. He currently serves as the co-chair of a committee of the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry that is working on objective criteria for creating and measuring the ideal behavior health system. He's held numerous leadership roles and has authored dozens of peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, monographs, and tools, um, that's a lot to say that Ken is one of the preeminent national experts in the space that we're here to talk about today, which is, as Director Chris mentioned earlier, figuring out how all Ohioans have someone to connect with, someone to respond to, someone to help them stabilize and ultimately thrive in the way that we at Pegs Foundation like to often say, someone to call and if need be, someone to come and if need be, somewhere safe to be so that ultimately our families, family members, friends, spouses, brothers, sisters can ultimately thrive. Dr. Minkoff. Well, thank you, Rick. Um, I, I was appreciating your rather lengthy summary of my accomplishments, um, but you're right. I was sitting there thinking that none of it compares to being a Green Beret and <laughs> that that's probably the right set of talents that's needed in this current journey. So uh, thank you for being part of the journey because uh, there's a, an awful lot of work to do, clearing the jungle, so to speak, of what we've been dealing with up until now. I'm gonna get my screen share going and uh, hopefully it will pop up so you all can see some slides. And let's see. Here we go. So um, what uh, I'm going to be talking about, uh, for me, I'm going to give you a little bit of a layout here. Um, as Rick said, I am the co-chair of the Committee on Psychiatry in the Community for the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry, it's a mouthful, that uh, produced this report. Uh, and Dr. Balfour and Dr. Munitz are also members of that committee. Uh, along the way uh, in developing this report, which we, we actually worked on for about five years, and I'll talk a little bit about how that happened. Um, uh, there came a time when we had an initial version of the report that needed review, and uh, PEGS Foundation actually was one of our relatively small group of reviewers along with other uh, colleagues that Dr. Munitz brought into play from Ohio. So we hold you guys in great regard for having supplied very specific and thoughtful contributions to the final product here. I also want to say how heartened I was uh, listening to Director Chris. Um, you know, um, 
Uh, Margie and I have been doing aspects of this all over the country. And I have to say that, you know, um, coming into this discussion in the Ohio Crisis Academy, uh, there's an immediate sense that you guys have a well-articulated vision. There's a sense of an organized, systematic approach that works uh, in partnership between the state leaders and the community level organizations and the providers in order to make this happen. This is exactly from the point of view of how we develop the roadmap, the right way to do things. And so it's very heartening to be able to be here with you as you guys are getting into the next phase of this journey with each other um, to give you what information we can about guiding the process. I'm going to be focusing in my presentation on the report itself. And Margie is going to take off from there and go into a deeper dive about one example of a model crisis system, uh, which is the one that Margie takes the leadership role for in Pima County, Arizona, or Tucson, which coincidentally is where I live too. Um, uh, and, uh, and also talk about some of the work that she's been doing in making this kind of thing real in other systems. And then we're looking forward to having Mark uh, share his perspectives on the, uh, you know, the strengths and challenges that face Ohioans in making this a reality. Now, um, I don't know how many of you got to look at the link to the report uh, before you started, but if you did look at the link to the report, not the executive summary, you'll have noticed that the report is 200 pages. And we, um, we are totally aware that uh, most people are not going to read 200 pages. However, um, we set about in this report to do something that was intentionally detailed and intended to both create a vision and a framework for thinking uh, that largely resonates with what Director Chris was talking about but also to, to provide what's in the title, a roadmap for people working in real systems, in real communities, to be looking at a level of detail for what, what do they actually do over an extended period of time to implement what this crisis system should be about. And we also use the very ambitious term ideal. So it's not roadmap to an adequate crisis system. It's not a roadmap to putting a band-aid on the current horrible crisis system that we have. It's roadmap to an ideal crisis system. And the way we came to that is interesting. Um, the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry is primarily an organization of psychiatrists that meets in committees to do cool things together over an extended period of time, you know, to try to advance the field. Uh, our committee, which is the Community Psychiatry Committee that I've been part of for um, 45 years, um, is of course, in our view, the coolest committee in the whole organization. And one of the things that makes us super cool is that we have added non-psychiatrists to our mix, realizing the limitations of our purview. One of the non-psychiatrists that we have added and one of the only or only two non-psychiatrist members of GAP uh, is Judge Steve Leifman, who's um, uh, from Miami-Dade County. He's arguably the most well-known and accomplished mental health judge in the United States, got an award from the Supreme Court, and also for a period of time but while we were starting this project, was the chairman of the board of directors of the Miami-Dade County Behavioral Health Managing Entity, which is a different structure in Florida, but more or less equivalent to one of your uh, ADMH boards here in, um, in Ohio. And he came to us, you know, we did a report on um, using the sequential intercept map and letters from Dear Abby uh, to talk about providing guidance for how to help people, uh, you know, get uh, with behavioral health needs 
uh, who were involved in one way or another in the criminal justice system. And as that report was being completed in 2016, uh, Judge Leifman looked at the rest of the committee and said, here's what I would like you to do for your next topic. Um, sitting in my board, we are often trying to think about how to improve our crisis services, but we have no idea what they should look like. And we looked around and we can't find any guidance for what they should look like. And since you guys are supposedly smart psychiatrists, um, maybe you can develop the specific indicators that we would know as a community managing entity. What would be the indicators that would tell us that we had actually implemented and, you know, an ideal behavioral health crisis system for our community, Miami-Dade with, you know, three and a half, four million people or whatever. And how would we know how we were making progress to get there? So we said, okay, that's the kind of task that we can get our teeth into. And um, the thing about GAP that makes it cool is that you meet as committees with a group of people that are really smart and everybody has great ideas. But unlike most projects that y'all are familiar with, this is something where you can really dig in over a period of years to get something to happen. And so we started this project five years ago and just totally coincidentally, it's one of those miracles in my view, the project came to fruition at exactly the right moment in time. Um, and we could not have predicted it at the time we started this. There was no 988 movement going on in the country. But um, as we worked on this, there were other materials that came to be and are, we were able to build on those to provide this detailed approach. So the report, is literally a guide, like if you're looking, what is the set of specific standards and measurable indicators for each of those standards that would help us figure out what our crisis system should look like for behavioral health, for mental health and people with mental health and or substance needs and or other challenges like intellectual developmental disabilities with overlapping mental health or substance crises and so on. What should this look like? How do we put it together? How do we know whether we've gotten there? So the report begins with a set of values and operational principles. And that's, I was sitting there like in awe of what Director Chris said, because I would like to feel like she took those values from our report, but I'm pretty sure she didn't. I think they came from you guys in Ohio, but they're very much lined up with exactly the way we're thinking that you start with values first. And then what we did that we think is particularly unique is we purposefully moved the conversation and you'll hear more from Margie about why that's so important. From simply like, let's find some programs to plug, in, plug into our so current situation to say, no, a behavioral health crisis system needs to be a system. And it starts with accountability and oversight for performance for the community. So there's a whole section on how to develop that, what it looks like, how to measure it, how to fund it, um, because it's not one crisis program all by itself is not gonna do the job. Secondly, we look at a continuum of crisis services, which are, again, not just a list of types of programs, but capacities and the way in which those capacities all fit together to produce the result that the accountable part of the system wants to see in relationship to the population and then operationalizes the vision. The third section is about clinical practice. So it's not enough just to have programs. <laughs> they have to take care of people properly. And, you know, this is like we pay so little attention to this piece um, that, um, you know, we felt it's important to emphasize that ultimately this is about not just what you have that you can point to, but what happens to the people who need, who actually encounter these services. 
Now, the thing about what we did is that there is a really robust array of best practices, if you will, um, both clinical practices and capacities and services and metrics, but they've never really been pulled together and organized because we've been so focused on the idea that um, if we have any crisis capacity at all, we should consider ourselves lucky and not be thinking that somehow it should need a set of standards. And we are purposefully trying to turn that conversation on its ear, which we hope that that's what you guys continue to do in Ohio. So in each section, getting back to the, this is written both for visionaries at one level, but policy nerds and practice improvement people at another level. Each topic includes what are the criteria or indicators for that standard, okay? And each section has multiple standards with each one has indicators. Each indicator has performance metrics attached. So this is how you might know that you've achieved it. And throughout, you know, where we could and where it made sense, we incorporated some local examples just as illustration um, for how this could be done. So we started with a vision as well. And the vision was intentionally ambitious. And I wanted to build on what uh, Director Chris said, uh, because um, I wanna make sure you understand just how radical this is. Um, there is no element, when you step back and you think about the gap between what we currently have for people with mental health and substance needs in crisis in almost every part of this country, compared to what we should have, the gap is dramatic and striking. The only reason that we have such a dramatic gap is connected to the historical stigmatization of people with mental health and substance needs. So that in general, it's the only category of illness where we can accept that it's okay that there's a substantial risk that a person suffering from an acute illness is reasonably likely to be arrested as a result. Further, that to the extent that we, this is historical, that we address that issue, we hope that we can find some resources out of our limited pockets to throw some band-aids into the mix. Now, what we're saying in this report is dramatically different. So first of all, what we're saying is, wait a minute, in this country, when we decide that something is an essential community service, we make it happen. So we say, you know, we need police. We need fire departments. And closest to this is we need emergency medical services. We didn't always have a 911 system with an organized and coordinated response. It took many years to get there, but we have one now. And we don't think about like, if we call 911 for a medical emergency, we don't think, gee whiz, I hope an ambulance will come. We know it will. And when we call and we say, hey, we're having a heart attack, they don't say, um, before we can respond, can you please tell us what insurance you have? Because, you know, if you don't have good insurance, um, we will send you an ambulance, but it's gonna be like, you know, horses because we can't afford engines, you know? I mean, we don't do that for other things. Like we call the fire department and we say, there's a fire. You know, I think something's burning in my basement. And they say, well, if you don't have good fire insurance, we're not going to come until we see that your house is actually burning with flames. Smoke alone won't do it. But that's how we do behavioral health. We piggyback behavioral health response on other things that are designed for other jobs. And then we're constantly piggybacking, thinking we'll only do better if extra resources come along. What we're saying instead at this point in time, and this is what I was hearing from Director Chris, it's time to change that. We have to say, this is what we should have. 
And then we need to figure out over time how to invest resources from all different directions to get there. And, you know, in any community, and this is interesting because we learned about this while we were doing our report, there's a whole EMS system in place with measures of accountability and medical oversight and community partnerships and multiple funders and, you know, all these different ways of creating accountability and structure that we all take for granted because it works so well. Not that it's perfect, but it works. And we don't have anything resembling that routinely for behavioral health crisis. So the vision is that this is an essential community service, just like police, fire, EMS, et cetera. And every individual, every family in every community in the United States will have access to the right response in the right place at the right time with services for crisis response that are best practice, welcoming, person-centered recovery, oriented, trauma-informed, ongoing, et cetera, et cetera. We deserve not to settle for less. And while it's scary to put this out there because, you know, you say, oh, my God, how are we going to get there? We can't do that, you know, overnight by next year or whatever. If we don't put that out there, we will never get there. So you all have to be willing to put a vision out in front saying right now we can't make this happen tomorrow. But if we don't shoot high for our planning and how we organize what we're doing and our resources, then we'll put a lot of effort in and we'll still only be a tenth of the way there and that's not going to cut it. The other piece of the vision, as I said, is that we're talking about systems, not programs. So we have seen over and over again, I'm sure you've experienced this, what we call kind of the Band-Aid approach. Everybody gets, oh, behavioral health crisis, or we're talking about that again. What's going to fix that damn thing? And somebody says, oh, mobile crisis. All right. Co-responder team. Oh, okay, that. Okay, let's fund that sucker. Okay? And then we have a program, and it, there's no system. So something gets responded to, and everything else is still backed up and under-addressed and on and on. And we're like, it's not fixed yet. <laughs> Here's another Band-Aid. So when you think systemically, you're thinking about an entire population moving through a service array that's held together by an element of accountability that's responsive to the needs of the community. An organized set of structures, processes, and services that are in place to meet all types of urgent and emergent behavioral health crisis needs in the defined population or community, which in Ohio is some combination of local in the sense of county specific. In large counties, it may have to be divided into parts of that county. And then also in Ohio, there are tertiary services that are organized regionally, but it all has to fit together just like we do for emergency medical response for both typical things and then unusual weird things. And it's all planned. Everybody's got it figured out with pathways. That's what we need to be doing. So here are some of the values um, in terms of the design. Some of them, uh, the first set of values uh, and principles is related exactly what to Director Chris was saying, welcoming and engaging customer-centered, hopeful, safe, compassionate, empowering, recovery-oriented, trauma-informed, and culturally appropriate, culturally fluent, culturally humble, so that people with any kind of background feel like it's a good idea to show up. And when they do, they are treated like the highly important, desirable customers that they are as opposed to what are you doing here? We're overburdened. Um, you're doing something wrong. You're being disagreeable, you know, this kind of thing. These values are important. And as we'll be talking about uh, through this report, we paid attention to the idea that values don't just happen because they're written on the wall. You have to operationalize them at a level of detail. And that means a really deep, set of instructions for everybody in the system, as well as metrics of accountability. And Margie can talk about some of the ways that happens in Arizona. 
The other thing about crisis systems is that they're accountable for everybody in the community, just like police, just like fire, just like ambulances. It's not determined by, and this is like a big radical idea, but shockingly, you can have the world's best insurance and still get a horrible behavioral health crisis response. This is not just about what experiences people who have no insurance or people on Medicaid experience. This affects everybody. And in a lot of states, what we're discovering, and the states are discovering it for themselves, is that people on Medicaid sometimes get better crisis response than people with commercial insurance. Arizona, as Margie will no doubt tell you, is coming to the terms where they realize that the state has been underwriting stuff that the insurance companies don't pay for for quite a number of years. And they're going like, why are we doing this? We're just not that normally nice. <laughs> so everybody is a customer of this system, just like other things that we do. Similarly, we have to get around the idea that we're designing this for the customers we actually have. So, you know, a lot of times systems try to create these like mythical rules, like this place is if you have this kind of mental health crisis, and this one over here is if you're in a substance crisis, and we have these other things for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and this one is over here, and that one's over here. And, you know, it's like people who are not in crisis have trouble figuring that out, let alone people who are in crisis. The people who show up who need us in whatever stage are bringing every one of their issues with them. And we need to design the service on the assumption that the next person we see is going to have multiple issues rather than let's try to screen them out unless they fit into a certain advanced box. Clinically effective and cost effective, which is why we incorporated whatever we could find about best clinical practices, we included. And we, you know, provided the implementation framework for those best practices. But cost effective means we're constantly thinking not about how to save money, but how to provide services in the most efficient manner that still do the job. And it's not always easy to figure that out. Um, but the clinical guidance is always to bias in the direction of taking good care of people. And that seems really radical until you remember we do this routinely in medical care. Behavioral health is the only place where if we wanna start a new service, we have to prove to somebody that if we provide additional helpfulness to people, that it's gonna save money. Now think about your community. Somebody is opening up a cardiac center or an oncology center. They're not talking about how they're gonna save money. They're talking about how they're gonna make money and save lives. Why is behavioral health any different? We have to plan what we do for everybody. So that simultaneously means articulating that we want our services to be so welcoming that people have an easy time coming in before they get to the point of having to call 911. At the same time, we don't wanna set up our services so that the people who are involuntary because they are there and they are desperately in need of intervention to save their lives or help them not hurt people or help them not wind up committing criminal acts that get them in super big trouble. Those folks need to be able to be helped as well. And Margie will talk to you about some of the ways that that has been thought through in Arizona, but you have to be able to think, not that every program responds to everybody, but your system has to be responsive at scale to the things that people need across the board. And finally, given the idea that this is about community performance as a system, then we have to get into the world of using data across the system routinely for measuring what's important to us as a community in terms of access, engagement, outcomes, flow, equity, and continually improving it. 
as in an organized process, not like we're going to pay you for so many widgets and hopefully you'll produce widgets and then we're done. This is a big deal. People's lives are at stake for how they move through the continuum of service. So one of the things we did, this is not for me because I'm the verbal guy, but we have cool visual people, Margie being one. I think Margie created the pyramid. And you'll see how there's a person in crisis. There are immediate people wrapped around that person, first responders, families, whatever. They receive clinical best practices, which are listed inside an array of services and service capacities, all foundation under a, uh, an entity that's responsible for accountability, finance, system oversight, and governance. Okay, and we have another diagram that's more circular. You can use whichever one you like. Okay. So in the way these slides are set up, um, you know, it's, it's designed it, so I can use it for a longer talk like this, or I can use it for, a, you know, a 10 minute zip through. So um, I'm going to kind of go through it uh, using these slides with the pictures to do a bit of a deeper dive. And then I'm going to show you what's at the end of the set later that are going to help you with implementation. There's another section that's built from the report where we have key takeaways um, in the report for each section that's kind of like a highlight thing. But I want to go a little bit deeper. OK, with some of these things, because they are things that I want you immediately to be thinking about as you're pulling this together. So it says an ideal behavioral health crisis system must have both a mechanism to finance and implement a con comprehensive continuum, as we're describing in this report, and a mechanism, a structure and process to ensure oversight, accountability, and quality of the performance of that continuum. Now, what that account, so we talk about, we, we pick this weird kind of term called accountable entity because we were trying to be structure neutral. And every system, every state has a different starting place for having intermediary structures that might fit this job. Uh, and every state has challenges to different degrees in figuring out what this is. Just remember that your EMS accountable entity does exist and it's created independently because you know, mostly folks don't have sort of the health equivalent of your ADMH boards. But in Ohio, you know, thinking about what is the role of the ADMH board as a starting place for this accountable entity? And then what positioning do we have to either utilize or expand that structure or to create a different or derivative structure that allows for multiple types of payment and different types of oversight for our communities? That's a detailed question that is a non-trivial but important question. So who would be responsible? How would you structure it? What would the structure of accountability be? Margie will explain how the regional behavioral health intermediaries, managed care, Medicaid managed care intermediaries and state dollar intermediaries in Arizona serve that function. And now they're trying to stretch themselves to figure out where do the commercial payers fit in? Where do other things fit in? And it's a constant process of evolution to get where you need to go. What most places will do, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, is to um, begin with pulling together the key stakeholders use your existing starter, you're like your board as a convener, get everybody together and say, this is where we're heading. Let's figure out how we get to where we want to go over time. So we're creating the accountability as we're developing the rest of the system. So now let me look at the different boxes on this chart. So one of the boxes is um, financing. Okay, so this is a lesson learned. 
bring the private payers in early into the conversation, not by asking them for money, but by asking them to be a partner. And there's fairly detailed discussions. Um, you know, uh, my consulting team with others did a project in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where we did this with a with the existing kind of Medicaid managing entity locally, um, uh, along with the hospital systems, the county executive, the psychiatric um, acute care providers, hospitals, you know, like that. And then, you know, how do we engage uh, Medicaid MCOs and commercial payers as partners? Where are there ways for them to contribute as part of this total effort that makes sense for them, both in terms of potentially better resource allocation as well as just being a good partner? Because, you know, for some of them, the cost of this business compared to the other things that they want to be hired to do is small. But you have to know how to engage and talk to people. Everybody's thinking about this. So it's like, you know, how do we start bringing funders in without scaring them off with the understanding that the more different contributors there are, the more success there ultimately will be and the burden on each individual funder will be less. This leads in turn into eligibility. So most payers already have duplicate crisis response, depending on, you know, what's on the back of your little card. Does this make any sense? 988, you know, the implementation of 988 is going to be driving a more uniform response. And everybody's got to be figuring out how to do it in such a way with customers first. Geographic access and network adequacy. I want to underscore this because this is one of my uh, big peeves and it just relates to um, some of the things that, you know, I've seen around the country. I know Margie has as well. Um, the current state is like a, a big county somewhere. I won't say in Ohio. Gets all excited because they have some sort of a crisis facility, crisis center, crisis stabilization unit, whatever. I've just been doing a statewide project uh, doing a statewide system assessment in uh, Missouri, a part of a consulting team, you know, funded by the Missouri Foundation for Health, which is a health access foundation. And by the way, your local foundations can be significant helpers in contributing to various things here. Um, but one of the things we discovered is, you know, Missouri can wave at you and say, hey, we have these cool things that are developed. But when you look at them, um, they're only responding to a minimum per small percentage, less than 10% maybe of all the people who have a crisis need. You can get very excited and say in this community, not necessarily in Missouri, we have a 16 bed crisis unit. Oh, isn't that wonderful? It's a best practice, yay us. Well, how big is your county? A million and a half people. You think 16 beds is gonna do it for a million and a half people? Not at all, not geographically and not volume wise. If you're working in conversely, instead of a bigger urban county, a large rural system, how do you do this in such a way with telehealth and whatever that you have geographic access and network adequacy? The same as you would for what happens if somebody's in a car accident in the middle of nowhere on highway, whatever because those things are organized and responsive. Quality metrics. If you don't count it, it doesn't count and it won't happen. Margie is the best quality metrics nerd in the world of behavioral health that I know, okay? So you have to figure out what you wanna measure and make it important. In the Grand Rapids project that we did, the first thing that the community collaborative that we helped organize said is equity is a priority. We have to measure the access of our system to people from underserved minorities, linguistic minorities, communities of color. And this is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. 
And so part of the job is to figure out how those metrics could be demonstrated compared to the, the population mix in that community. But other quality metrics are important too. Timely access, timely access for clients, timely access for law enforcement. Outcomes in terms of connectedness to continuing care. You can have a beautiful crisis response, six days in an inpatient unit, and then you're handed off to routine care and you're given an appointment to come back in two weeks or a month. And you're still meeting like a HEDIS measure somewhere along the line, but it's inadequate. So you need to measure each element of this, and this is why we spend so much time kind of identifying measurable indicators. And each community has to decide what its initial priorities are as it sets this in motion. Similarly, there's a whole art of contracting, whether through the accountable entity, directly, indirectly, through intermediary payers. How do you create the right mix of carrots and sticks, performance incentives, to help people actually make progress. You don't want to set the targets so high people fail. You don't want to set the targets so low that they're meaningful, meaningless. In many communities, one of the things that makes Arizona successful that people don't appreciate is Arizona has been doing this managed Medicaid stuff for a long time and they've gotten good at it. So they know how to create good contracts. It's amazing how many places don't. And But if you don't, don't think that you can just make it up, ask for help, get help to do it well, look at other people's contract, look at what can be measured and incentivized as you go. Flow through. It's very important, as I said, to talk about how you're accountable for people's moving through the system. And part of that is how the different components interplay with one another so that if somebody is moving through one, they naturally get connected to the next and someone is holding responsibility for their continuity, okay? Tracking, this is what we're doing now with call centers, but it's not just a number, it's like being able to um, capture the data collectively, individually, are people getting stuck? Are we looking at customer service? and literally considering every aspect of a negative customer experience as something that is, um, um, you know, requires uh, individual or collective root cause analysis because customer experience in behavioral health crisis is so important to success. And the last one is relation to the rest of the system. So we have to design our crisis response, not just like, in the abstract, but every place where somebody can't get help through the routine system, the crisis system needs to pick it up. And that has to be designed so it's proactive, not like we purposefully design things so people point fingers and the clients fall through the cracks. And so there are specifics about how to do that that we put into our report so people could see what it looks like and how to measure it and how to know it's there. Here's the second section, okay? And <clears throat> so part of the, the issue is, let's look at above the line first, population capacities. So <clears throat> you need to develop your crisis system with the idea that there are adults and there are kids and there are older adults and there are adolescents and everybody needs a response. A lot of systems have gone down the path of developing stuff for adults and left kids out. And what then happens, and you know, if you go to many children hospitals in large areas, they have all these people like silting up in their medical boarding units, you know, who have behavioral health crises, and there's no response for them. And so they start making stuff up inside those units. And then we're looking at the <clears throat> um, the service components and capacities within this. So do we have responses that allow for people who have medical needs? Do we have responses for people who are actively using substances? Do we have responses for people who are deaf and hard of hearing? Okay, so all of those things have to be built into our capacities. 
And we have to have the staffing capacity and the clinical leadership capacity commensurate with what we're trying to do. So, you know, what, um, you know, if you go into a medical emergency room, there's a physician in most places, in some places it may be a PA or something supported by a physician who's got a specialization in emergency medicine who holds responsibility for delivering the care and the standards of care in that emergency room. There's medical and clinical leadership for the delivery of service. Sometimes what we've been doing in behavioral health is we try to find the cheapest people we can find and throw them into the mix and expect them to make complicated decisions without access to the clinical leadership that would be helpful in those, those situations. We often will set up staffing for something that we're so busy saving money that the thing is understaffed and it can't take care of the people that it's designed to take care of. We are beginning to recognize the value and importance of embedding peers into our crisis response continuum everywhere because they are so enormously helpful, not in opposition to the medical, nursing, and clinical capacity, but complementarily to it. So we lay all of that out. And then we walk through this continuum. So there's some notion of crisis center or crisis hub. And this concept is, may or may not be a physical location. So there's two different things. One is, as Margie will say, her, her center is both. It's kind of an organizing everything center for the whole county, where there's capacity to coordinate responses at multiple different levels. Not all of it is directly through them. There's other things that they don't do. But the idea that there's a coordinating center so the, the calls come in and there's some coordinating capacity across something that you can, you know, that people can point to. And that's the clinical center of accountability, different from the accountable entity. That's what this is gathering up. And then there's the crisis center, as Rick said, you know, the, uh, this in court break, the place to call, a place to go. A crisis center obviously is a place to go as well as a place to call. And the most well-designed centers have walk-in through one door and secure drop-off through another door. And there are different ways of cobbling all that together, depending on your community and what's available space-wise and what you can pull off. But you need to pay attention to the importance of both. And then 988 is triggering the development of call centers and crisis lines of different kinds, but the 988 mechanism and the, its ability to be crosswalked with 911 in both directions is very important. And the, a lot of the federal government planning has been building this out of the federal NSPL, because that's what the federal government does, Nationalized Suicide Prevention Lifeline. But that capacity is way less than what's needed and is disconnected from crisis lines that are already existing. And so part of what everybody has to figure out locally and statewide is how do we use as much of our existing capacity as we can to build a collective ability to manage our 988 call system and encourage people to call sooner rather than later and to have a continuum of response at the other end of the call line, depending on the level of urgency and the type of request. One of the things we're doing is that, and I didn't say this strongly enough at the beginning, but we've got to get away from the idea that crisis response starts with law enforcement. Law enforcement is a component, co-responders, CIT training, that kind of thing. It's not the answer, and it should not be the answer, as CIT International will be telling you, tells you that Behavioral health crisis is a clinical issue. And just like in other areas, law enforcement can be supportive in certain kind of risk situations. But we don't want to be setting up any community where law enforcement is the starter place, first responder for behavioral health crisis across the board. Okay, they, they need to be able to be engaged easily when there's a risk situation that requires that level of response and to have people who are CIT trained participate. But for the most part, that's not the default. Medical triage and screening needs to be built in. So it's amazing how many people open behavioral health crisis centers. And they're still, I just talked to some recently, 
who were like, oh, if they have a medical need, we're going to send them to the ER. And it's like, that's backwards. So building in, whether through telehealth or on site, that most medical screening does not require an ER. People should not go to an ER for medical screening unless they're sufficiently medically risky to require it. That's part of what needs to be built into the continuum. Then we have mobile crisis for adults, mobile crisis for kids, one-time response, continuing response, walk-in urgent care, which is kind of a, a newer concept that's starting to develop that can be part of a crisis center or completely separate. Think of how many medical urgent cares we have in our communities and how few have any behavioral health capacity for an urgent care walk-in. Some of these were set up in, uh, in the Michigan community that we work with and they were enormously successful, but we have to design them so that they're, you know, at, at least break even. Um, and then people have a place to go. Continuing crisis intervention, crisis is not a one and done. It's not like 911 call, then disposition and we're over. It's a continuum from the earliest indication that something is happening, we wanna respond quickly. And we don't wanna let go of the person until they're stable enough and connected enough to participate in continuing care. If we fail to do that, they're just gonna cycle back and forth. We have 23 hour observation. We have a, in our report, we laid out a whole continuum of residential crisis services. And the term crisis residential crisis stabilization are used in all kinds of weird and complicated ways. Different states call different things by different names, even within the same state, different funders pay for different services. We are pushing for a national consistent language so that we know what we're talking about and that there are different levels of intensity of residential crisis services, depending on how much medical and nursing input they have, the staffing array, the level of security, uh, the level of peer support, you know, there's a whole array of different things that we articulated in this. And we recommend that in large areas that you don't just have one kind, that you have different kinds. And, um, and sobering centers are a subset of that that you can incorporate if you wish, that are not detoxes, they're just safe places for people to go who need to be helped getting sober. And that hospitals are important partners, both the medical units, the emergency rooms, and the inpatient units. But it's not about the bed capacity. I mean, it is, but it isn't. It's like developing that as part of the continuum, not starting as bed, missing beds are the problem, but their lack of a continuum is a problem, but you have to pay attention to how the beds are being used and whether they're incentivized to take the people who are most acute which is an issue in a lot of systems where they're incentivized backwards. And of course, transport, okay? So all of these are things to be thinking about. Oh my God, what a lot of things to be thinking about. Absolutely. So take a deep breath, okay? It's all laid out for you in the report. Okay, what are the following things that we wanted to include? These are a little bit more obvious, but what, what's important is to recognize how much this hasn't been put into writing with any level of detail. So, so we start with core competencies, like how do you welcome people? What does trauma-informed service in a crisis setting look like? What are the basic practice guidelines for an appropriate crisis clinical assessment? Okay, do we have those in place and are we utilizing them according to the best practice? And we incorporated that. Um, <clears throat> do we have formal screening using best practice tools? for risk of suicide and violence and things like that. So that we, you know, it's not perfect, but at least let's provide some structure and have some specific plans for follow-up. Do we have practice guidelines for intervention with people who are, say, for example, saying they're suicidal and are also actively using substances? So they were taking those people appropriately seriously, evaluating them appropriately while they're suicidal, not waiting for them to quote unquote, get sober before we talk to them. Um, and is that all written down? Is that how we train people? Do we have adapted practices for children, elders, people with intellectual disabilities? Do we have access to consultation for specialty populations <clears throat> when we need them? 
And then do we have guidelines for how we coordinate care with family members, information communication, proactive connection from the crisis components of the system to the continuing care components of the system so that everybody is stepping closer to each other and held accountable for those um, handoffs in such a way that the person who's highly at risk is able to make that leap with an overlap of responsibility. So these are the things that are incorporated. Here's our circle. Mr. Y is our sample person that we use to illustrate the adventure. This is a little bit more elaborated diagram with circles and colors. If you like that better than the pyramid, you can use one or other or both. And then we created some tools to help with the implementation process. And I just wanted to just go through those quickly. But before that, you know, the National Council published this for us and are taking a lead role in disseminating it. And one of the things they're advancing, which is very appropriate, is the idea that certified community behavioral health centers, which has been an enormous successful implementation effort with expanding funding from the National Council, um, can be part of the solution and we should pay attention to it. And in fact, as we're going into CCBHC 2.0, uh, there's an interplay between how those are funded, uh, how those are cost-based, if you're familiar with the methodology, and the recognition increasingly of what not only the CCBHC will do directly, but the importance of building the collaboration and the accountability across the community. So here's some things that CCBHCs do and uh, what they've accomplished that help to make that case. Here are the resources. In, um, in our report, we identified all these other resources that have been flowing. So, um, uh, there's Crisis Now materials, there's stuff from Nashville. Our intent was to take everything that came out and build it so that it was more robust. And in particular, the SAMHSA guidelines that are used, you know, that are in, kind of directed and connected to the block grant set asides that came out in early 2020, um, those cover some things, but not at the level of detail that we do. And we strongly encourage states and local communities to use the SAMHSA guidelines, but also to use this material to flesh them out. So here's an example of the 10 steps for, whoops, I went too far, for communities. And here are some starting places, um, just to illustrate 10 steps for communities, identify and convene partners, read the report, develop a vision, share the vision in your community, figure out your starter convener, doesn't have to be your ultimate accountable entity, it can evolve, create an implementation team and collaboration. And then in the report, there's a three page report card. That's a simple rated checklist that says, here's what we've got, here's what we don't got, here's where we are in process, and that's intended to be a relatively simple, if you don't spend four days talking about each item, a method of creating baseline data for where you are that you can then use individually as a community or collectively as a state to have a data-driven sense of, of progress and implementation. Find some early wins, start collecting data, develop your plan, rounds of applause for progress. And that's the end. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, are we ready to move on, Rick, or anything yeah, we, else? We sure are, Ken. I, I uh, very grateful and appreciate um, the great outline of not only the report, but the work that's in front of us. And these, these last two slides were just incredible um, because if, if anyone in attending is like me, there there's some folks that are experts, some folks that, hey, I got this. And there's a lot of us, I think, that are like, whoa, how do we do this? And I really like that 10 steps and particularly, you know, thinking about what's a vision, you know, the, this idea of convening, you know, just creating that sort of collective will to, to get after this. And, and, and circling back to what you said earlier about you know, one of the things, and I think this is what Director Chris meant earlier, is um, 
we we respect and understand the need for communities to to figure out what is appropriate for where they are in their geography and what resources they have but in the same token we don't just want a nice place that serves 16 or 30 or 300 people when the need is a thousand or more and to have the ideal vision and pursue it i think is, is prudent and i'm grateful for what i know the folks at the state are doing governor dewine and really a lot of communities across our state are thinking about um, not just figure, you know, one off, here's a cool thing to do because I saw something in another state, but it's really thinking about that scalability issue. Um, so thank you. And for folks that, uh, just as a reminder, I think Courtney uh, mentioned this, um, go ahead and put any questions you have in the Q&A function. I know we had one that asked about private um, providers role. Um, we're gonna have a panel at the end, so we'll, we'll start gathering questions. And if uh, you know if the if the presenters choose to, they they may see something come up there. But don't be afraid if you're or not afraid, but, but certainly lean in and ask questions, and we'll collect them up and and hopefully get them answered towards the end of these at the end of the program today. So up next is Dr. Margie Balfour. Uh, Margie's a psychiatrist and national leader in quality improvement, behavioral health crisis care, and law enforcement responses to mental illness. She's the Chief of Quality and Clinical Innovation at Connections Health Solutions, which provides immediate 24-7 access to mental health and substance use care throughout Arizona, and is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Arizona. Dr. Balfour is named Doctor of the Year by the National Council for Behavioral Health for her work at the Crisis Response Center in Tucson, and received the Tucson Police Department's Medal of Honor for her efforts to help law enforcement better serve the mentally ill population. She's contributed to numerous expert panels for SAMHSA, the DOJ, and others. Her pioneering work on defining crisis metrics has been adopted as a national standard by SAMHSA. And she co-authored the Roadmap to the Ideal Crisis, Essential Elements, Measurable Standards, and Best Practices. Margie is a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and serves on the Council of Quality Care. She's also served on the Board of Directors of the American Association of Community Psychiatrists, the American Association for Emergency Psychiatry in NAMI, Southern Arizona. A native of Monroe, Louisiana, Margie received her BA in biology at John, Johns Hopkins University, and then her MD and PhD in neuroscience from the University of Cincinnati. So we'll claim, we'll claim part of your background, Margie, for, for, oh, Bearcats. for, for spending some time here in Ohio. Uh, she completed residency and fellowship in community psychiatry uh, at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Um, and all that to say that Margie's really cool, as is Ken and as is Mark, but Margie, you're the coolest of the three today. So Thank you. Uh, please proceed. No Thank pressure. you for joining us. No pressure. Well, let me share my screen. And I do hope we can start traveling again soon because I really miss graders. And you Ohio folks know what I'm talking about. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about um, our, our system out here in Arizona and how it really, um, really illustrates a lot of the key features of the roadmap that, that Ken was talking about. And that's a picture of Sedona I took out of my front window when I was driving. And if you ever have a chance to come visit, it's a lovely place to visit. So you know, so, you know, why are we here is because, as Ken was mentioning, we have the default system in the U.S. is if you call 911 and say you have chest pain, you get an ambulance, and we have an expectation of what that emergency response is. But currently, um, for many places, um, if you have a mental health emergency, you end up with the police. And um, this really has sets things up for some tragic consequences. Um, a quarter of officer-involved shootings are linked to mental illness, and half of these are in the person's own home, meaning, you know, suggesting that they called for help, and then this is what happened instead. And then when you factor in race and ethnicity on top of the disparities with mental illness, it, it's just magnified. But it's, uh, I started making crisis memes lately. So this is a meme I made um, trying to illustrate just the convergence of all of the stuff going on in crisis now. This is a really critical time because all these different things are converging. We've got 988 coming. Um, we've got 
the social justice movements around trying to decrease that disproportion, you know, response with, with law enforcement and the officer involved shootings. You've got all this um, funding coming down the, the federal pike around crisis, you know, crisis care. And then you've got states getting together, um, you know, to come try to figure out the crisis system. And all this is happening at once. So we really have a great opportunity. Um, the right part of the slide just shows with 988, which is kind of like the first first step that's happening. Um, I mean, we only have like a month for that, or I mean, a year to get that done, which is a huge undertaking. And it's going to connect to the lifeline, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is an existing network of call centers. But um, that's just the green part in that um, in this schematic. There's estimated to be another um, you know, 13 million calls a year that are coming from, that are going to call centers that are crisis lines that are not part of the lifeline. And then 911, it's estimated that about 10% of the 911 calls um, are mental health. And so if you put all that together, that's 40 million annual crisis calls connected to a system that has, you know, been taking care of 3 million. So um, yeah, that's a huge undertaking. And then um, I, I highlighted this article because then what? Because once you've got the number, it's got to connect to something. And to succeed, it really has to have a system to connect to. Because um, we're going to end up with this now. So we'll still have the chest pain, people go into the ambulance like they should. Hopefully law enforcement can be more focused on crimes. And hopefully 988 will um, you know, be sending you know, our superhero mobile teams for when there's a mental health emergency, but there's still gonna be some in between. In between, you're never gonna get rid of law enforcement responding to these crises completely because there may be unsafe situations or they may come upon a situation that wasn't identified as mental health to begin with, but later it became clear that that was the issue. So you're still gonna have this complexity of response, but, oops, but then what? So if we implement 988 and don't do anything else, then there's a danger there that you're going to basically create a huge amount of demand that wasn't that you know you're getting to people on the phone um you know and maybe via mobile teams more readily than you were but if there's no place to bring them or no crisis system to handle them you're going to potentially make an already bad situation worse like today we already have the situation where 84 percent of emergency rooms are boarding psych patients 60 percent of them have no psychiatric services whatsoever so patients are just waiting with no care um, which leads to increased risk of assaults and injuries costs a lot terrible patient experience so we could you know, without a crisis system to receive these 988 calls, you know, you could end up flooding the EDs and making all those problems worse. Um, and then, you know, like I said, we're still going to have police out there. Um, and whenever you talk to police about mental health and diverting people to treatment, and you know, the police, most police really want to do that. They don't, they know that bringing our, our people to jail is not the best thing, but they're, and they get trained in CIT and they're told to divert to treatment. And their first question is always, well, divert to what? So they end up in jail when the officers don't have a quick and easy way to connect them to treatment. So that's another example where you really need a crisis system to be able to receive these folks at, at the, you know, kind of at the first responder level. Um, you know, otherwise we're going to potentially make some of these issues worse. And you know, like Ken was saying, we settle right now for this system where it's easier to get into heaven than to get into psychiatric care. But we need to reframe and think of a behavioral health crisis as a potentially fatal health emergency, like a heart attack and a stroke are. And you know, we wouldn't tolerate this sort of piecemeal thing that we have in this country for for heart attacks or stroke. Um, what we need is a systemic response with the same quality and consistency that we expect for those other health emergencies. And so why don't we have a national standard for crisis? Um, you know, a big part of it is it's flown under the federal radar for so long. It's primarily funded by states, um, by Medicaid, which means by states, and by, that means every state does it differently. Medicare doesn't pay for it. The private insurers don't pay for it. Um, and, you know, all of that, a lot of it probably ties down to stigma, too. Again, we wouldn't, you know, 
we'd be all up in arms if like our grandmas are being treated like this for when they call the ambulance for, you know, for chest pain. So there's been progress towards national standards. Um, and the solution's not just beds. You know, you hear a lot of whenever people are upset about their mental health system and we just need to build more beds. And so Nashbid really, you know, they, they came out and said back in 2016, no, it's not just more beds, you need systemic approaches. And then you may have heard of Crisis Now, which describes some of the core services in the Arizona model, which is the phones and the mobile teams and facilities. Um, that was kind of updated in the SAMHSA guidelines that came out last year. And then as Ken was saying that the, the roadmap then expands upon that to really talk about the governance and the financing and not just the services, but what is it that you need to support the functioning of those or an oversight of those services. And so when we say system versus services, um, so you need, this is a slide that I stole from SAMHSA years ago from Bruce McKeon and or Rich, Rich McKeon. And um, it's got, there's a great continuum of services that are available out there. And there's studies showing that, you know, they work for this population and, you know, they're, they're good for this and that. Um, and the, you know, the more robust a continuum that you can have, the, the better. But the important thing though, is that they don't all operate in a vacuum, that they work together um, in a coordinated way towards common goals. And that way then you get the, the whole system is more than the sum of its parts. And it's kind of an example, or, or you know, what do you need to, to, to get that? Um, well, first is accountability. So who's responsible for this system? Um, you know, if you've got all these different services and they could be operated by whole different provider agencies, like who's responsible for making sure they work together, um, who is holding the values and the goals, and who is holding the providers accountable. And oftentimes this is closely tied to the governance and the financing structure. You need collaboration, um, crisis in particular, um, more so I think than a lot of other aspects of healthcare, really has this broad group of stakeholders. Um, it goes from law enforcement to schools to um, you know, the emergency rooms to mental health providers and peers. So it's a, you know, it's a, you need a culture where um, the stakeholders want to collaborate and they communicate and they want to solve problems together. And then data, like Ken said, I'm a data nerd. And, you know, if we're saying that we have common goals, then how do we know if we've met those? Um, how do we know what we need to improve? Um, so data is, is really important. And so the Arizona system, so when, when we were working on the report, um, the Arizona system kept coming up as kind of a, a model program to, to emulate. I mean, it's not perfect, nothing's perfect, but a lot of what we were talking about is, is kind of baked into the Arizona system. And it's, in, it's financed and administered via Medicaid. And I wanna make, that's an important piece too, because um, another sort of stigma thing is people are, are saying, well, how are we going to pay for all of this mental health crisis stuff? And maybe we can go look at the city and the county budget and take money away from some police stuff and put it into crisis and this and that. Would we like have that conversation about any other medical emergency or health emergency, except for one with the psych diagnosis attached to it? Like we don't say, well, where are we going to take money out of the county budget to pay for heart attacks? Like we expect the healthcare system to pay for that. And so it's the same with behavior emergencies. So crisis services are healthcare. And so um, the bulk of the funding comes via the healthcare system. And so in Arizona, um, like Ken was saying, we've been doing managed care for a long time. Arizona has never had anything but managed Medicaid. Um, we were the last state to have Medicaid back in the 80s. And it was put in place in part because of a lawsuit around mental health. And the Goldwater Republicans of Arizona would not pass the, the legislation unless it had the words cost containment in the name of the department. So it is Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System or ACCESS, which is our Medicaid uh, department, which I always kind of laugh at that because I thought it meant like the other kind of access when I moved here. But it actually explains a lot because we were the last state to have Medicaid, the first state to do a statewide managed care waiver and what that means is from the very beginning, 
We've never had fee for service Medicaid. It's always had to be thought of as a system because it's you know in this managed care structure and so the way that it currently works is so you've got access at the state level and they divide the state into geographical regions the north the south and central so the bright blue is uh, maricopa which is phoenix we have a, a large crisis center up there too and the uh, dark blue is southern arizona um which is tucson where i met i'm going to be talking mostly about the tucson programs and um then so they put out for competitive bid um, an RFP to be the beha Regional Behavioral Health Authority, which we call REBA for short. And it's essentially a managed Medicaid entity with a whole bunch more contractual obligations on it than you typically see in, a, in just a regular managed Medicaid plan. And so the one that we have currently is Arizona Complete Health, which is part of Centene. And then they contract with all the different providers like us. Um, the funding is all, they braid multiple funding sources, um, which is a really important piece when you want to talk about sustainability. So they get the Medicaid funds. They also get the block grants from SAMHSA. Um, there's a state line item in the budget for crisis, for uncompensated crisis, which um, is something our organization actually lobbied hard for back in the, in the early 2000s. And then the, counties can send money up to access and then back down also and so all of that is braided meaning that it all goes in one pot but on the back end it's all allocated like who what pot of money paid for what person services but the person on the front end doesn't have to worry about that and so the you know the point of this is that you know ken talked about an accountable entity and we have that that accountable entity kind of baked in to how the whole system is structured and paid for. And so what that means for crisis is that, so that REBA, that Regional Behavioral Health Authority, they're kind of like the conductor on the orchestra here where, um, you know, the, their centralized planning or centralized accountability. If one of the providers is not in line with what the whole system needs to be doing, then they can say, hey, like, you know, let's, what do we need to do to get you back aligned? Um, and the other nice thing about crisis, um, from a clinical standpoint is that the financial goals and the clinical goals are pretty closely aligned because what I want as a psychiatrist is I want my patients to not be in jail, not be in the emergency room, not be locked up in the hospital if they don't need to be there. And instead I want them engaged in care and stable out in the community. And if you're paying for stuff, you want that too, because community-based care is less expensive than all this acute care. Um, and so the system can set goals. So I'm sure a lot of, since you have the, the founder of the sequential intercept model amongst your ranks, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Um, and, you know, so the, the, the system up at the state level even can set strategic goals that will filter down. For example, the sequential, we want to keep people out of jail. Um, so that's where you want your crisis services, um, you know, to focus on that. And so at the state level a while back, um, the they set a strategic goal around that. Um, the, this sort of illustrates how this structure can, can support goals like that. So if you think about it, um, just from a fiscal standpoint, like why should the Medicaid director care if people are in jail or not? Because, I mean, besides of just being like a good person, but, um, but just, you know, financially, that person is off your spreadsheet. Their people's Medicaid gets turned off when you go to jail. Um, and but at the state level, you know all that money eventually comes from the same place, which is us taxpayers. So the state had this thing where they were having the department head share their budgets with each other and come up with these cross departmental goals. And so one of these was reduced justice costs for people with serious mental illness. So then. When the Medicaid director access um, put out the you know the request for proposals to be one of the regional behavioral health authorities, that was part of that application process, which was you know explain to us how you're going to reduce justice involvement for you know, the members in your in your system, and then when they get the contract, um, they then have to contract with providers like us to deliver the services that are going to meet that goal. And so part of that is this culture of 
treating law enforcement as a preferred customer in the crisis system, because if they have the people that we want to keep out of jail, then we need to make it easier and faster and better for them to hand them off to the crisis system rather than to take them to jail. So what that means is the crisis line, um, they've got dedicated lines for law enforcement to get through faster. Now they're actually co-located over at 911. The mobile teams have an hour to respond to like me in my house if I'm in crisis, but if law enforcement calls them, they have a half hour in their contract. So things like that. Um, and so that just kind of illustrates how if you've got the right governance, accountability, and financing structure, you can really make these broad strategic goals happen down at the provider level. This is kind of another way of looking at that, um, where, so you, you know, if, if your goal is to stabilize the crisis in the least restrictive setting, which is out in the community, um, which is often the least costly setting, then you can think of the continuum of services like arranged along that continuum. So you've got your person in crisis and kind of the, the least restrictive thing is a most community-based thing is to pick up your phone and call the crisis line. So the crisis line for the Southern region gets about 10,000 calls a month and they resolve about 80% of those on the phone. And they do that via you know, count, crisis counseling, um, suicide risk assessment, but they also have eyes into the system and they can make appointments. So by contract, all the clinics have to put crisis appointments into this system that they have. So if it's in the middle of the night, but that person knowing that they have an appointment at like noon the next day is gonna help resolve their crisis, they can do that. If the, and if they can't resolve the crisis on the phone, then they can dispatch the mobile teams. And there are about 16 mobile teams that cover Pima County, um, different numbers at different times of the day, um, but they operate 24 seven. And even though it's a couple different agencies that operate them, they're dispatched centrally by the crisis line. So they all have the same phones with GPS software on it, where they can push the clinical info down to them and they can tell where they are like they've got the map with the blinky dots and stuff. And um, and so they, they, they dispatch the mobile teams. And then if the mobile teams do a face-to-face, -face, then they resolve about 70% of those out in the field for people that have crisis that's still more acute than that. Um, they can go to one of the crisis facilities like ours, which I'll talk about in more detail. Um, and after an overnight stay, about you know 60 to 70% um, end up going to the, are able to be discharged back to the community, avoiding the hospital. And then there are services after the crisis to make sure that people get connected to where they need to go and, um, and to keep people stable. At every point along here, there is easy access for law enforcement. And that's where that whole intercept zero one concept comes in, where we're trying to make it easy for law enforcement to get this person to treatment rather than progressing down arrest and, and the jail path. So I mentioned the crisis line. Um, they now have staff co-located in 911 so they can intercept calls. So they never make it to a 911 dispatcher. It's a crisis line person that ends up answering it. Um, so there's no police response at all. Um, you know, 911 of course is gonna, or 988 is gonna integrate into this. Um, the mobile crisis teams, I mentioned that they have to respond faster to mental health. We also have some co-responder teams um, and just you know a variety of things that the mobile teams do um, with law enforcement. And then our crisis facilities were really meant to basically be faster and easier than jail. So getting the officers out in less than 10 minutes, never turning them away and, and collectively all of this working together then decreases people needing to go to jail, the emergency room or the hospital. Now to the officer on the street, it doesn't look that nice and lined up, right? Um, there's many, many different service providers and places to choose from. And how is the officer supposed to know? How are they supposed to know, well, this guy needs to go to this facility and then this lady, she needs to go over here. Um, that's why we don't ask them to figure that out. That's why we have this, what we, this is where the no wrong door concept comes in, is that all of us members of the crisis system um, work together and we do training and stuff and you know officers are pretty good at figuring out who needs to go where but but if they don't it doesn't matter um we're never going to turn the officer away we're going to say thank you sir may i have another 
and then we will work amongst ourselves to get the person to where they need to be. The kind of the centerpiece for this in Pima County in Tucson is the Crisis Response Center, which is where I work. Um, the county built this with bond funds in, in 2011. We've been managing it since 2014. And here's where um, it's important that when, you, when we're talking about sustainable financing, so the county built the building and it was like, I think it was like $15 million to build it. Um, but, and then they do some maintenance on it, but the everything that goes on in the building, the services are financed via Medicaid and the REBA. So those are healthcare dollars that are ongoing funding. So the county came up with the capital, but then they didn't have to keep up all of this funding to keep running it. That all comes via the healthcare system. They rent the building, they lease it to us for, or to the REBA to, to, for a dollar a year. So it's like the best rent ever. Um, but you don't have to have a, a nice fancy county building. Our Phoenix facility is space that we lease and had built out, um, you know, and, and then the services again come through Medicaid, through the REBA up there in Maricopa County. Um, the, the county really wanted this to be an alternative to, to the jail, which they run, um, and the emergency room and, and the hospitals. Um, it serves about 12,000 adults, 2,400 kids per year, and it is the major law enforcement receiving center. Um, so we take involuntary and voluntaries. People can be highly agitated, highly intoxicated. It doesn't matter what their payer is. Um, services, there's several different levels of service inside. For both adults and kids, there's a 24-7 urgent care walk-in function where anybody can walk in and say, I need to be connected to services, I'm new to town, or I've missed my appointments, need a med refill, um, or, you know, or just I don't know where to go. And we can get those folks taken care of um, in a couple hours, usually. The heart of the operation is a 23-hour observation unit, which I'll talk about in more detail. And then um, for people who need to stay a little bit longer, we have uh, an inpatient unit for um, an additional three to five days, and that's for the adults only. It was really meant to be a place for the community to come together. So, um, although not so much during COVID, um, but there's space for various co-located community programs that throughout the life of the building have, you know, have been different people. Um, we've had a peer run uh, post-crisis wraparound program in there. Yeah, pet therapy, because we're, Crunchy good all the people down in Tucson. We like that kind of thing. Um, and it's part of a cool campus. It's basically on the county hospital campus. And the the crisis call center is in our building, um, run by a different agency, but but in the, our building. Um, it's connected via a breezeway to the Banner University of Arizona Emergency Department. And the bond also built a 66 bed inpatient psych hospital where most of the involuntary commitments go. And the court is right there at the bottom, in the bottom of, of that building also. Um, this is our um, you know, kind of our, our philosophical approach is you know, we address any behavioral health need at any time. And the reason I put that up there is because it really is the mindset that you have to have to, to operate a facility like this. So people talk about CIT a lot, like Ken was saying how, you know, people always, it's tempting to jump to just, oh, there's this thing. And if we do it, we'll solve all the problems. And CIT is kind of like one of those. And people all often think of it as the training, the 40 hour training that officers get, which is so kind of the centerpiece of it, but it's not the whole thing. Um, if you go back and you read all the original CIT literature, it talks about how it's a community response of which the training is one part, because then same thing, the question comes divert to what? And so in those original CIT kind of like founding documents, it um, lays out what the ideal mental health receiving facility would have. And I highlighted these two in the middle, because as we've gone around the country and looked at, at other communities, that's the two that people have the hardest doing well, which is the no clinical barriers to care and the minimal turnaround for law enforcement. So your law enforcement turnaround time is if it takes 20 minutes to book somebody into the jail, then you need to get officers out in 10 because it needs to be faster and easier. Um, the no clinical barriers to care, that is sort of what Ken was talking about with the, you know, anyone who looks like they might have a medical issue, you got to take them to the ER first. Um, 
like you want to basically take everybody of true wrote no wrong door approach so you know you'll get sometimes you know people will go well you know what if they're too violent or too agitated that makes no sense to us like if that's you know that's what we do we want the agitated violent people because in a center like this we actually have the the space the staff the training just the whole setup to be able to de-escalate that person if we said no we can't take that person they'd end up in an emergency room restrained on a gurney in a hallway probably so or go to jail and so if our mission is to keep these people out of er's and out of jails why would we turn those people away we don't use security um because we give our staff a whole lot of training and we feel that security guard guys are nice but our staff is the highly more highly trained so why would we default to somebody with less training um you know we can take people you know who are you know people will say well what does their bal have to be and it's like well can they set up and eat a sandwich and they can come over here um you know they can be involuntary or voluntary the payer source doesn't matter um we don't require medical clearance for everyone before they come now the police are better than you would think about knowing who actually needs to be in an emergency room versus who doesn't i joke with my cop buddy i'd prefer you not bring me somebody unconscious but if it does happen um you know what makes more sense turning that officer away to put them back in their car and have their unmedically trained self drive them in their unmedical car off your property or to say or to have everybody in your facility trained on basic life support and have um, protocols to quickly get someone transferred to an emergency room so we transfer about um i think it's about like four or five percent of people to the emergency room and um so it's very low um if they actually need to go there and um this is kind of showing our you know this whole idea of law enforcement as a preferred customer um you know what are officers when we meet a lot with officers and they were involved in the design of the building um what are they like or what they don't like is they don't like to wait they don't like to be turned away and they don't like people hassling them about taking their guns off so they've got a dedicated entrance with the gear gated sally port so they buzz a thing and it opens closes behind them um that way they come in on their own entrance they don't have to be you know bringing somebody through a waiting room with everyone looking at them and because you know, that's just uncomfortable for everyone um they can get out in and in and out really quickly they don't have to go walking around the building looking for somewhere to make a copy or go to the bathroom or get some water um and then have the clinical staff go you can't have your gun on in the clinical area um they've got everything they need back there so they've got their own little office that has the forms that they need um they've got a fridge it's a keurig in there now um they got their own bathroom on national donut day they get donuts so it's all just it, it's set up for them to be able to um, be able to access it they prefer to come here rather than to jail and our turnaround time last month was three minutes so we really are getting them out quick the unit itself um, is it's an open area, so it's not like emergency rooms where there's all individual rooms. Um, the reason why is for several reasons. One is if people are you know, the, the criteria to be in the in the observation unit versus be seen in the clinic are um, danger to self, danger to others, acutely psychotic, agitated, intoxicated, or in withdrawal. And so these are people who are potentially dangerous uh, because of their mental illness or substance use. And so the way you keep people like that safe is to be observing them continuously so that you can intervene or catch things early. And so it's an open area so that the staff can continuously observe people. And also too, like if you think about what happens with, if you go to an emergency room because you're suicidal, they put you in a room by yourself, they take all the stuff out of it so you can't hurt yourself. They hire a sitter who's supposed to sit there and watch you, but not supposed to talk to you about why you're there. And like you do that for 12 hours and just stare at the wall waiting for a psych bed somewhere. And that's not very therapeutic. Before we even had meds in psych, like the, the old um, psych hospitals, we had what was called milieu therapy, which is the idea that social interaction amongst people has a therapeutic value to itself. That's why psych units today always have that kind of open common area day room in the middle of it um, and then flexibility so um you know we never say no um to the police 
And so sometimes we'll get surges in volume and having it open like that allows us to kind of flex based on um, you know what we need. The one on the left is the youth unit. It does have these little half walls. We inherited the building like that, but um, you know that it's a smaller unit, and so it is kind of nice. Um, and then for the adults, like that's our adult unit on the right, and we also have a smaller overflow unit too that's a little quieter, um, that's smaller. And then the twenty-three hour observation. This is like I said, kind of the heart of the operation. And it really is meant to stabilize crisis. Um, and we start with the assumption that we're going to resolve the crisis. Um, and this is where, you know, that, that whole thing where, um, you know, people want to jump to the solution. We just need more psych beds. Like we don't believe that all those people need to be admitted to an inpatient psych unit. If you start treatment early and aggressively and really um, work with your community partners to get a good discharge plan. So we are staffed 24 seven by either psychiatrists or other provider like, like nurse practitioners. Um, we have peers with lived experience, uh, nurses, techs, case managers, therapists. Um, we're able, we wanna intervene early. We really measure our door to dock time and try to keep that night below 90 minutes um, so that we can intervene quickly. And the interventions could be meds. Um, it could be detox, um, we can start Suboxone. Um, but also we're doing groups, uh, peer support, where our, our um, caseworkers are immediately on the phone, talking to families, talking to the clinic, trying to find out what's going on with, with these folks and what do they need to be able to be stable in the community. And so we don't ever go whenever someone comes in and when we first see them say, oh, you're really sick, we're gonna put you on the list for, for the hospital. We say, oh, okay, you're in crisis. Let's figure out what, you need to resolve that crisis and then we work on it and then we assess them again towards the end of this overnight you know 23 hour period and then if they're better great then we work on getting them discharged but if not then we pursue hospitalization so we try to make hospitalization is not the default and then that saves the beds for those who really need it and then you know kind of helps deep you know decrease boarding and things like that because then you're opening up you know the beds for for those who, who need it more um there's lots of other flavors of crisis stabilization like i was saying before like you know there's no common nomenclature for these things um what i was describing is typically um termed 23 hour observation um there's we also i mentioned we have a subacute inpatient unit that um, we can keep people there for a little bit longer um, then you may hear about living rooms. Those are typically um, also short term, but they're less acute. They often can't take people who may be agitated or violent because they, you know, they aren't able to do restraints or things like that. Um, they're sobering centers and social detox. Those are typically um, for people with substance use needs and you know, a detox center uses meds like medically supervised detox but some of the sobering centers don't it's just an observation and a place to engage with people but without medications crisis residential um, is typically like a more intermediate term um, where people stay you know, for days to weeks and again these are just general general descriptions because every state does it differently and it's good to have a continuum of these it's always good to have a broad of a continuum as you can get but you need some place that's going to take everybody because if you don't if you only build one of these low acuity things then the most difficult patients the ones who are agitated and intoxicated and and potentially violent they're going to still end up in the er or jail and then people will go, why do we spend money on this crisis center when we still have this problem of these psych patients in our jail and emergency rooms? So that's just my opinion. Um, we have a really uh, great relationship with our police. Um, so the Tucson Police Department, they have a very sophisticated approach towards mental health and they are a huge partner in, in all of this work with the crisis system. Um, they actually, had been, I mean, they've been doing CIT training since like 2000, but um, they really looked at what they were doing and and expanded their approach after the um, January 8th, 2011 shooting um, with where Jared Loeffner 
fired onto a Congress on your corner event. And that's where um, Congressman Gabby Giffords was shot. After they looked at that, they're like, how did that guy fall through the cracks? Um, they started to develop these dedicated teams that do nothing but mental health, in addition to having most of the, the police force CIT trained. So these teams, the mental health support team, does nothing but mental health stuff. And they're really focused on prevention. So um, we have a lot of people on assisted outpatient treatment in Arizona. And so they, um, their team uh, focus, com, just exclusively serves those orders to pick people up. Um, and they're playing clothes and they get to know people, they get to recognize patterns. They also pick up people where there's other sorts of civil commitment orders to pick them up. Um, and then the detectives are the ones who look for people who may be starting to have some struggles and need to be connected to treatment. Um, for the police, this was like a huge cultural shift because if you talk to police, they typically don't investigate things that aren't crimes. So you know, if you robbed, you get a robbery detective. If there's a murder, you get a homicide detective. But like, I'm concerned about my neighbor. There's not a weird stuff detectives. And so that's what they do. And so they focus on um, cases where someone looks like they've got some kind of mental health issue going on and that it might also be related to something with public safety. And then they really start investigating and finding out what's going on with them. Do they have a clinic they're supposed to be at or have they never made contact with the clinic and how can they get them connected? And I think that in all the years they've been doing this, it's been since like 2014, that um, they've only like actually arrested one person. So that's really focused on getting people into treatment and preventing type things. Um, their training approach, um, you know, really starts with the leadership. I mean, so just like you can't fix all of crisis by implementing like one program, same thing with law enforcement is you can't like, you know, do really have a, this um, holistic approach towards serving people with mental health issues with just like a co-responder program. It really is an organizational approach from the leadership on down. And um, and the chief here really buys into all of this, um, has been expanding all the mental health services over time. Um, all of their officers get uh, basic mental health first aid training, which is eight hours. The research shows that CIT works better if people volunteer for it versus being voluntold. And so, CIT is voluntary, but they've incentivized it such that 70% of their force is C wanted to get CIT trained and CIT trained. And then these specialty units like the mental health team, um, they get some advanced training. Um, like they've even gotten training in like motivational interviewing and trauma informed care, which is like, it's not typically what you see with cops, but um, you know, they've, they've really uh, done a lot of great training. And all of us crisis folks in the community and mental health providers all help out with their training. Um, just some some data is, um, you know, so this on the left shows our police drops um, per month and the circles are the turnaround time. And this is old because um, it's three minutes now. We did a, you know, it crept up to like a little past 10 and we freaked out. And so we did a whole new process improvement thing and now it's down to three minutes. Um, and then what's interesting is uh, the most places when the police are dropping people off, they're um, involuntary. They're on whatever your pink slip or Baker Act or whatever your state has um, for involuntary. And uh, the light bars here are the voluntary drops. So they're so good at engaging with people and saying, hey, like when we come, you know, I'll give you a ride to the CRC so you can get some treatment. They'll do that. Um, so that's kudos to them. And then you can see like the, there's more and more people being taken to treatment. Um, you know, it's been trending up pretty much consistently. And then early on, they looked at some of their, um, you know, when, when the police are bringing people to jail with mental health issues, just to get them off the street, they tend to use these, what are called nuisance call charges, like civil disturbance, vagrancy, that kind of stuff. And um, so those have been going down, you know, since they started doing this. And then you have SWAT, the SWAT team, like if you go, because you have like an emergency order 
to pick somebody up for evaluation because they're suicidal and the police officer goes and knocks on the door and then the op person tells them to go away and not coming out that's technically a barricaded suicidal person which in many jurisdictions is like an automatic call to the SWAT team which my cop buddy says if they're not going to come out for his two plainclothes guys they're not coming out for 30 guys in a tank so like why spend fifteen thousand dollars doing something that doesn't work and so they stopped doing that they handed those over to the mental health teams and um they manage those now and so you can see those have gone way down you know and if you want to make you know you you want to make the argument that what this, what we're doing is cost effective and it is on the health side but also on the justice side and so this is the kind of thing you know to show your um, city government and, and police chiefs there's also um various co-responder programs now so there um is a co-responder where and this is sort of an example where you take these models and you have to make them work for your community because we went out to la where they sort of are like the pioneers of the co-responder model and rode around with them where they have the clinician and the cop in the car together. And it made perfect sense for downtown LA, which is very dense. And they were just bouncing from call to call to call to call. Tucson is very spread, spread out. Like Pima County landmass wise, it's like the state of New Hampshire, it's huge. So they found that having the cop and the clinician in the car together was a lot of wasted downtime just driving around. So now they moved it where there's dedicated mobile teams that just go to the missed teams when they want, when they need them. And then they can be working on other stuff when they're not riding around. And so that's just sort of an example of how um, you need to always look at your local community needs. And they've already had been doing so much to divert people from jail. They then started to see, well, can we try to divert people from having to be involuntarily committed and get them to go voluntary. And so, um, you know, so they decreased once they added the co-responder, a lot more folks, they were able to get voluntarily into treatment, and not have to send them to the hospital. Um, the deflection program has a peer and a um, officer, and they um, focus on substance use related calls. And then they have the discretion to not arrest um and so they divert people straight to treatment there's a clinic in town that's a mat uh, a medication assisted treatment clinic that um is open 24 7 so they can bring them to treatment any any time and then the homeless outreach team um that they typically uh focus on a couple of the different parks and it's an officer and a homeless recovery peer from one of the housing agencies in town and are out there trying to engage people and get people into housing. Um, this is from the Crisis Now website, which is um, got a lot of crisis related stuff on it, um, which is a study that Arizona Medicaid did looking statewide at the um, just all of the money for crisis and where it comes from. So, you know, you can see that it, you know, it comes from the stuff on the bottom, which is state funds, Medicaid, and then you can see Medicare and commercial, like nothing. And then um, where it goes, but then the return on the investment um, from decreased use. And this is doesn't even include the jail. This is just healthcare costs. Um, by investing in this, they um, calculate a return of investment of 370 million. And like, where does that kind of come from? This was another um, study done a little bit earlier than that looking at the uh, Maricopa crisis system up in Phoenix. And, um, you know, that saved hospital EDRs like 37 million because of the losses, because of your boarding patients. Um, and they calculated that that was equivalent to 45 years of, you know, like person years of, of boarding. Um, and then 37 FTE of police officers because of police not having to take people to emergency rooms and wait with them and all that stuff. And then I just got 10 minutes, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because um, I'm a data nerd. And so, you know, when we took over, when I um, took over the Crisis Response Center, our company had been running the UPC, the Urgent Psychiatric Center in Phoenix, and we needed a way to compare across facilities. And so we, um, there aren't any standard outcome metrics for crisis or there weren't back then. So we created this. This is a, um, a, a, uh, technique called a critical to quality tree. It's a tool that's used a lot in quality improvement where you, you come up with the metrics based on 
what are the things, what's the value that you're trying to bring? And so you know, we want timely care. So we have metrics around how quickly people get seen. We want things to be safe. So we have metrics around injuries, um, accessible, um, least restrictive, both in terms of you know, seclusion restraint um, metrics that we benchmark against the Joint Commission's national average for inpatient, but also least restrictive in terms of the disposition. So are we getting people in to the community versus the hospital? Or if people come in involuntary, even if they do go to the hospital, are we able to engage with them so that they accept treatment voluntarily? Um, we look at readmissions for effectiveness. Um, we look at uh, patient satisfaction. Um, and then our partnership metrics are things like our law enforcement turnaround. So things that, you know, are things that our partners care about. Um, since then, we've got, you know, our, our regional behavioral health authority has adopted that, um, our crisis framework for, for measurement. And so, because the, there's multiple smaller crisis units um, you know, throughout the Southern region. And so now they are able to, you know, they can compare apples to apples when they're looking at their whole network. Um, and then we've started to look at, well, use the, using the same kind of method, what about the whole crisis system? So for example, um, timely and the red ones were because we were this is a working document and these are the ones that we thought somebody already measures but for timeliness um you know so we measure door to doctor time in our crisis facility the call center has like speed of answer um or the abandonment rate the mobile crisis teams has like time from dispatch to when they get to you so um you know at the reba level because they contract with all of us they can take all that data, put it together, and they can look at um, multiple providers because like, you know, like if I'm the person in crisis, I don't care that it took like this long to answer the phone and then this long from the dispatch to the mobile team and then this long from when I got to the crisis center to be seen. I care from when I picked up the phone and when do I get my needs met. And so they're able to start to kind of put things together this way and look at things more you know, holistically that way. Um, and then this is a, an example of how, um, you know, if you partner with your, your REBA, like I call them our benevolent overlords sometimes, um, you can actually use crisis data to improve the whole system. So I love this quote from Brene Brown, where she says, maybe stories are just data with a soul. Because what that means is every time someone comes into the crisis center, it's a story about how they couldn't get their needs met in the community. So what if we turn those stories into data and would that reveal trends about things that need improving in the overall system? Um, you know, because you someone comes in crisis and you're like, why are you here? And I couldn't get in to see my clinic. Um, I don't have transportation. There's some problem with the pharmacy and my meds won't get filled. I don't have a safe place to stay. All of these are, you know, things that, you know, they're gaps in our in our care or social determinants type things that need to be addressed. Um, but if you are the REBA who is responsible for this whole system of care, typically the data that you have to look at that kind of stuff is based on claims, which are at, at best, you know, 30, 60, 90 days old. So it's like, you know, the Hubble telescope is like looking back like a million years. So if you're a Reba looking at claims, you're looking back three months in time. So we worked out a daily data feed where we send the Reba data of everybody who's coming through. Um, it's now real time, but when we first did it, it was, it was monthly or it was daily. And then we meet with them every uh, month and go over all the trends because they are then able to use our data along with data that they have to do some more sophisticated tracking and trending. For example, um, this is one of, our, one of our first projects, which is um, we know people coming in, what clinic is responsible for them. But we don't know how, like one clinic may be, you know, have like 100 patients in it, and another may have like 1,000 patients in it. But if they both sent five patients to the CRC, then that means very different things. So we have the numerator of how many people from each clinic were in crisis that month. And then the REBA has the denominator, which is how many people are in that clinic total. So then you can look at the percentage of each clinic's population that had a CRC visit 
And so you can see the orange one, which was actually one of the smaller clinics. So the absolute numbers weren't like out, you know, they didn't really stand out. But once you look at it this way, you can say, oh, they're an outlier and you know, they, they need some help. Um, we also did um, a project with our what we call familiar faces, which is our nicer word for high utilizers. So we you know, looked at our data and came up with the definition for the top 20%, um, which was, I think, three visits in the previous quarter, four visits in the previous quarter, and um, would run a list every month and send it to the REBA. And um, then they would help facilitate multi-agency meetings to say, OK, what's going on with this person? And what are we going to do differently the next time they come? And then flag their charts so that like the, the new plan would happen as soon as they hit our door next. I mean, it's pretty simple, like do not discharge before adult recovery team with you know, this guy's case manager, who's Jerry, and there's Jerry's cell phone number. Um, so as a result, we first did it, there were 64 people on that list. Um, a year later, only seven of the original 64 were still meeting that familiar face criteria. Then there were only 37 total meeting that criteria. So not only did those people get better, but the churn got better. Um, you know, this is kind of an example of, of what we did, which was, um, so we had a woman who would come in here all the time because she would, on the weekends and at night, she kind of like get all ginned up with her own thoughts and start getting overwhelmed and then suicidal. And so she either called the crisis line or non mom one and come into the seats, the CRC. And so the plan for her was to do welfare checks on these times that, you know, we knew were triggers for her. The clinic did that. Um, and she also, she wasn't engaging with her clinic. So on the other, you know, on the one hand, you could get all annoyed and say she's non-compliant and she's help rejecting. And we told her to go to the clinic and she won't do that. She keeps coming here. Or you could try to be more strengths-based about it, which is what we did and said, well, it's, she feels safe here. It's not that she can't engage. She's engaged very well with us. She feels safe with our staff. She knows what shifts they work. Um, we need to try to get her feeling that way towards her treatment team who she's never met because she's never in the clinic. So, I mean, the, it was pretty simple. Then the peer that had been assigned to her at the clinic, the plan was as soon as she hit the doors of the CRC that we were gonna call that person and then she would come and meet with her. And over time, if you look at that first quarter um, before we did anything, she had 14 visits in that first quarter and then a year later, just one. So that's what we tell, you know, it's this concept of be a detective and not a bouncer, um, you know, not stopping if they don't need to be here and try to figure out what it is that they actually need and help them get their needs met. Um, we also looked at our youth unit. So this is weeks, um, how many visits we have per week. And you can see that it's, my cat wants to talk to you too. Um, you can see that it really maps with the school year. So that then kind of informed the, the REBA to work with the schools because they have school-based services to see if they could, you know, kind of, do some more intense work out there during those times. Um, and then also like tracking and trending which schools were sending us people. So this is an analysis that um, the, the, the REBA did where they looked at the number of the schools in the county versus how many times the mobile teams were being brought out there and saw that there were some outliers. And so they piloted some programs which are now permanent um, where they targeted some co-located services in those schools. and. Um, were able to do it all with um, either Medicaid funds or, or like SAMHSA funds, but um, but it was no charge for the for the kids. And then we looked at return visits on youth and saw that those also um, were decreasing. And then I'm going to just to say that um, you know in the beginning we had like just one payer for all. It was one Reba that did all of behavioral health. Um, our met access, our Medicaid department has been slowly wanting to move people to integrated, like to what, so that everyone only has one plan that does both physical health and behavioral health. And so on the one hand, that's good because it's primary care and physical and mental health integrated. But on the other hand, we sort of lost that, well, we just have one single payer, um, which makes it easy to do a lot of these things. And so I was very doom and gloom. This was like a slide I had in one of my things about integration is coming. But um, 
but what what though is maybe applicable to your situation in Ohio is you kind of have that situation and our Reba was able to really step up and offer some of this infrastructure to the other plans which it made sense for them to adopt because it makes the whole community better so that's just it went from really easy to kind of complicated um but what like for example the crisis line um they are able the crisis line kind of um compiles data from the crisis system because the reba is still the payer for the first 24 hours of crisis and so they're able to get data on everyone accessing the crisis system and what health plan they belong to and then get that info to the health plan quickly um and yeah i'll skip that but and then just one last thing is you know that's um when you've got a system with all these engaged stakeholders you can really do these multi-agency problem solving things so this is like we like i said we have a lot of aot assisted outpatient treatment in arizona and just like for people just with regular visits we have a group that gets that it's called when when they're not inherent or not doing well um their outpatient status is revoked so we call those revocations so you know we have a group that gets revoked a lot and so we're like who are these people and the police know who those people are because they bring them to us and these little red and orange areas turns out are group homes so we had the group home guy where you know the guy acts out over like something minor like using the phone or cigarettes or something and then the manager of the group home calls 911 and says well he's court ordered so and he acted out so he's revoked which is not how you're supposed to do it. People actually have like a due process. You can't just do that. But the police would know that the paperwork hadn't been done and then they would bring them to us and we wouldn't know who they were. And we are all so customer focused. You know, we were like, oh, it's no problem. Officer, we'll call the clinic and sort this out. But it was the officers that were so distressed that they were kidnapping people that they were like, no, you have to fix this. And so um, with our REBA, um, we were able, to, and the police at the table, were able to get all these different agencies um and the whole flow was not important but um but all these different agencies to work out a new process for when group homes have someone that they think needs to be revoked um about it going to the crisis line instead of 911 and then the mobile team goes and tries to handle things and then they interface with the clinic and then law enforcement's not dispatched until all of that is taken care of and so you know we saw a reduction in those those uh, repeat revocations so just to wrap up, because I'm four minutes over, is that the solution is not always more inpatient beds. You need a system um, with accountability, collaboration, and data. And the culture is important. You want a culture of no wrong door, and let's figure out how to say yes, rather than look for reasons to say no. And also, it's important to remember, we've been doing this for a long time. Um, it didn't happen overnight. Um, things started in 2000 with CIT training and the uh, first mental health court. And then ex in, later, in the later years, it's exponential growth of a bunch of cool programs and stuff, but it um, doesn't happen overnight. So with that, I am done with my part and ready for questions. Awesome. Thanks, Margie. Appreciate it. Um, so what I think I want to do now is there was a couple of questions specific to Pima County, and there was a couple other general questions. If I could ask Margie and or Ken, yeah. if you want to shoot and just go into that Q&A function and answer those directly. I know something was like about, is it behavior health only and oh. facility or- uh, What is the crisis response canine? Um, right, and all that kind of cool stuff. Yeah, so our REBA, our Regional Behavioral Health Authority has, this is part of the thing too, where they are a managed care company, but the state has all this contractual stuff on them. So they're not just like big evil corporation. They have to have, they have to do community reinvestment. And so they have community reinvestment funds. And so they um, got therapy dogs for the MIST teams because during some of these long car rides, um, the therapy dog helped. And then it was such a big hit. They do them at the jail now and then school resource officers because um, it's amazing. Like you'll see people they won't talk to the officer, but then if they're petting the dog, then they'll talk to the officer. Like it really, you know, but that's this crisis response canines. Gotcha. Thanks, Margie. 
So shoot some, if you don't mind doing like the direct, like type in. Well, you can type in the answer and, in. Oh. Right, yeah, let me, let me get, um, I'll get Mark going. And then as we circle back, um, we, uh, we'll go back through. I just wanna let everyone know that I just put questions in there. Um, and I wanted you to make sure you knew they weren't languishing, that we're, we're gonna circle back um, to yeah. that and, and hit some direct if we can. So next up, um, I wanna introduce, and most everyone in our state knows who you are, Mark. Um, Dr. Mark Munitz, uh, Professor and Chair Emeritus at Northeast Ohio Medical University, and he's also a Distinguished Fellow here at Higgs Foundation. Um, prior to his retirement from Neomed, Mark served as a Professor and the Margaret Clark Morgan Chair of Psychiatry at Neomed from 2007 to 2019. He directed community psychiatry training at Neomed and served as Medical Director of the County of Summit, uh, County of Summit ADM Board. Uh, from 1992 to 2012. Uh, he founded the Ohio Criminal Justice Coordinating Center of Excellence, which a lot of counties know is, is one of the unique things here in Ohio. We go in and do SIM mapping uh, to see what the attributes and what some of the gaps are at the county level. The Ohio Program for Campus Safety and Mental Health, which is addressing uh, the needs of students in behavioral health crisis at, at what went away at college. And then best practices in schizophrenia treatment, which is an effort, all of these at Neomed effort to get what we know works into the hands and in, in, into the, the um, community so that people that suffer these illnesses can actually receive excellent care. He's held faculty positions at Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh, University of Massachusetts and Case Western Reserve. And Mark, um, no offense, Margie's slides are way cooler than yours and, and, and cooler than yours as well, Ken. But Mark is one of those local champions that anywhere other than here in Summit County, they oh yeah, I know Dr. Munitz. Everywhere else, you're like famously and well known, and we appreciate the passion that you personally bring to, to the issue. Uh, so, without further ado, Mark. Well, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Rick. I'm going to try to uh, share my screen. So I do want to thank um, Rick for that lo lovely introduction and, and, and a huge thanks to Ken and Margie for the fantastic presentations they made. Um, I, I, I was part of the GAP committee going back many years with, with Ken uh, and was there at the beginning of the um, thinking about uh, putting this roadmap together um, and had some input into it as it developed, but, but uh, uh, was, was not involved with uh, what I would call the heavy lifting in the, in the final uh, creating the final product. Uh, so it's great for me to have a chance to reflect on um, what I heard uh, from Ken and Margie, but, but and, and, and to share some thoughts that I have. I think a lot will um, support what we've heard already. Maybe I'll challenge in a couple areas uh, and a couple of uh, thoughts about where we need to go in Ohio to uh, move along the path of implementing the roadmap. We'll start with some um, disclaimers and caveats. Uh, I don't have any conflict of interest, uh, but I, um, I did borrow um, some information uh, from, from Ruth Samara and her staff at the Criminal Justice uh, Coordinating Center of Excellence at Neomed to, to try to get uh, more up to date. I've been retired for a year and a half, and um, that means that I can maybe speak a little bit more freely uh, opinions expressed will be mine alone. Uh, I'll show my biases. And one of my biases is I think psychiatrists need to provide leadership to achieve the vision of the roadmap. It um, concerns me at times that um, my specialty isn't more involved in all of this. It's rare um, to have three psychiatrists presenting as, as we are today uh, in, in my experience. And I don't think there are a huge number of our colleagues in, in the audience. My focus is on adults only. I'm not, um, I'm just not an expert on kids. I know how important including addressing kids issues are. And, and I may be a little bit behind because uh, uh, I'm not doing this work uh, seven days a week anymore. A couple of observations and, and um, actually Margie um, um, set, set this up really nicely for me. Uh, you know, the focus on crisis services is really important and, and it's necessary, uh, but um, this one underlines not sufficient. 
And, and I, I hear sometimes when, when we're talking about the crisis response continuum, that we need to, uh, that, that the crisis response system should be working on crisis prevention and post-crisis care. And I think Margie made the point that that's actually filling gaps that reflect gaps in the overall mental health system. And, and um, so my, my um, mantra, if you will, is that a community's mental health crisis response system can only be as good as that community's mental health system. And it, it's a burden at times on, uh, on, on the crisis system um, when the mental health system overall isn't doing what it ought to be doing. Another tension that I think needs to be acknowledged, and it, it was referred to again, but I think it helps to be explicit about this. <clears throat> and it's a tension between the desire to integrate mental health care with the rest of health care and the need to meet the needs of individuals with serious mental illness and, and, and the multiple related complex conditions, substance use disorders, developmental disabilities, <clears throat> et cetera, in a specialty mental health system. I think we need both systems and they need to work together to make sure that everyone gets their needs met in the most appropriate setting with the greatest ease of access. And that's a lot easier to say than to do. Um, it came up some <clears throat> while he was talking at, 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 at the end of her talk about payers, uh, but it works, uh, it, it applies throughout the system. I think for us to be successful and we have experience being successful in Ohio, uh, we need uh, both a top-down and a bottom-up approach. Top-down is leadership from the state for the vision, policies and statutes, statutory changes if necessary, uh, administrative code and investment. And, and uh, clearly we need much more investment in our overall mental health system and the crisis response system in particular. And bottom up at the local level, local collaboration is where the work gets done and uh, where the rubber meets the road. And there are multiple levels of these collaborations, police, EMS, mental health, patients, advocates, uh, maybe I probably should call patients peers. Um, we have great opportunity now with the coming of the 988 line um, to work on integrating 911 and 988 as we're hearing they're doing in Arizona. Uh, collaboration between hospital-based services and the specialty mental health care, health care in general and specialty mental health care. And then this accountable entity that's been talked about um, which is so important that there has to be a place, and I would argue a person, a clinician, where the buck stops in that community. Someone who, who the CIT uh, uh, coordinator for the police knows they can, they can call, uh, or, or a hospital or a mental health agency or an uh, individual with mental illness or their family to say, this isn't working, how can you help us to improve the system? So we do have a great strength in Ohio, and, and you know, Ken alluded to this, uh, we have the Adams board system in the state, and it seems certainly possible that the boards could serve as the accountable entities. And uh, I believe there still is in statute the need for a chief clinical officer who could serve as or delegate to a crisis system coordinator. That's one of the recommendations in, in the roadmap report. However, the board's role has been weakened in recent years with Medicaid elevation and the role of Medicaid managed care companies. And I'm not clear that there are many, if any boards or other entities where there's an identified clinician leader who can respond to concerns about the system or a specific case that anyone may have. I think that is a logical role for a county crisis system coordinator and would address the fragmentation of accountability that we have today. If there's one major criticism of our crisis response system in Ohio today, it's that no one is clearly accountable in, in my opinion. So CIT is not the only answer, there's no doubt about that, but we're very fortunate and I think it's a great strength in Ohio that we have robust CIT programs. Uh, and, and we have trained officers in all 88 counties and remarkably, I, I believe 75%, uh, three quarters of all the police agencies, almost a thousand police agencies in the state have CIT trained officers. The 25% the, the not uh, with CIT officers are very small agencies for the most part, sometimes uh, not even any full-time um, staff. Over 12,000 um, CIT officers have been trained 
we now have 45, and it may be today 46 of the 50 board areas that have uh, mental health CIT coordinators, law enforcement CIT co coordinators, or both. And increasingly over recent years, not just law enforcement, but dispatchers, EMS, uh, court personnel, we've had, we've had uh, judges, probation, et cetera, participate not only in the 40 hour training, but in the ongoing CIT program. And it, it, as Margie was arguing, and I totally agree, CIT officers are sometimes, um, and I think it's probably fair to say often an appropriate first responder. But also the CIT officers and the CIT programs in the state are strong advocates for improving the system's crisis response. Communities with strong CIT programs around Ohio today have been working on developing or have developed co-responder and other alternative response models. It's being driven in part by the relationships between law enforcement and the mental health system. And we have CIT steering committees in many of, of these uh, uh, counties and, and, and board areas that, that serve as a, as a basis, a, uh, a start to an existing cross-system collaboration. And we should be very pleased with that. Also with the coming of 988, we should be pleased with the fact that 20 CIT programs representing 33 Ohio counties have participated in dispatch training of trainers. So this is preparing local communities to train their dispatchers in responding to mental illness uh, crisis calls. Uh, and I think my number's a, a little bit behind because another class was held recently. So I think this positions Ohio well for what I hope will be strong collaboration between 911 and 988 as 988 develops. We also have multiple other cross-system collaborations that provide, a, again, a, a framework, a start to the collaboration needed to uh, create the um, ideal crisis system. 50 Ohio counties are stepping up counties. At least 16 of them, and I think it's probably more like 30 some, have working advisory committees, stepping up committees that have many of the stakeholders needed at the table to address the crisis response system. And sequential intercept mapping uh, has taken place 43 times uh, over, over the last 10 years, 29 of them focusing on serious mental illness and co-occurring substance use disorders, 11 on opioid disorders, three on the, on the kid system. The, the, the most common um, gap identified in sequential intercept mapping in the uh, serious mental illness mapping exercises across the state, the most common gap was in the crisis response system, oftentimes not having a place uh, for the police to bring someone in need. Those communities started with very energetic work groups to problem solve and to implement the action plan that came out of the SIM mapping. And those again serve as terrific opportunities for the community to move forward. However, I'm not sure that everyone that needs to be at the table is at the table in each of these counties uh, or, or board areas. The, the, the groups that I think might be absent, and I'm sure this isn't inclusive, uh, includes folks from the hospitals, uh, inpatient units and, and emergency department personnel, EMS, not always at the table, particularly absent, I think, all too often are, are, are the payers, the Medicaid managed care plans, as well as private insurers, individuals in recovery. Uh, some communities have trouble finding peers to participate. And, and we found um, it, that it's interesting in, in, in the difference between having a peer who's a peer recovery specialist who's working for the system versus having a peer living in recovery who's not part of the system. And the latter actually often um, speaks it with a more powerful voice, uh, maybe ironically or unexpectedly. Um, families we generally get at the table, NAMI groups in Ohio, as everyone knows, are very strong. And we do need to make sure that we have all the underrepresented minorities appropriately represented uh, in these groups. One of the great strengths, so I, I, I just went through kind of the bottom up issues and now I'm gonna do the top down. And, and we do have a great strength that's evidenced by the fact that we're doing this today. Um, leadership at the state level, 
OMAS and the Board Association, the Ohio Council, NAMI Ohio, uh, Pegs Foundation uh, has become an increasingly key player. And, and um, so that, that, that's, a, that's a, great, a great place to be. And it, it's great to hear from uh, Ken at the start that uh, we shouldn't take that for granted. It's not, it's not something you see in every state. But I think there are a lot of questions and, and, and based on, I think what we heard today, uh, we shouldn't be surprised if the answer to these questions is not yet or no, because these are, these are big challenges and are gonna take a long time. But just a few questions that I have for the state leadership. And one is, you know, has OMAS and Ohio Medicaid working with the counties, the boards and the agencies developed clear billing and other funding mechanisms to sustainably support each component of the crisis response continuum? Develop mechanisms for the counties to be able to track the kind of data that Margie was talking about from multiple systems to inform the crisis response system. Have they brought private and managed Medicaid insurers to the table to assure their role in funding the crisis response system beyond just the fee for service reimbursement, which I know is a bit an issue in and of itself, but um, these systems cannot function, I don't think, uh, only based on fee for service reimbursement models. Has OMAS and the Ohio Medicaid um, system working with the counties and the provider agencies written clear definitions and appropriate licensure standards for, among other things, the 24 seven freestanding crisis centers. So it's clear that such centers can receive both voluntary and involuntary patients, as we heard is so necessary. And, and I, I'm aware of places that say they can't receive someone who, on a pink slip. Uh, and I also know there are centers that say, if you're well enough to walk in here, you don't belong here. And that's wrongheaded on both, on both uh, ends of the spectrum. And, we, uh, and are there clear written definitions and appropriate, appropriate licensure standards for crisis stabilization units or whatever we're calling those subacute residential alternative to hospital uh, units? I think what we're calling them varies from county to county, just as it does from state to state. So with 88 diverse counties, 50 boards, has the state developed a plan to not only develop, but to maintain this crisis response continuum in every community? And the um, question is, has there been thought to something like a crisis response system coordinating center of excellence? It's a question that, that Ken asked uh, in a pre-conversation prior to this call. And um, well, you'll hear, I think it's a great idea. One additional observation, and again, Margie and, and Ken both sort of made this point for me already, um, but the medical crisis response system has taken 50 years plus to, de to develop to where it is today. Uh, many of you were probably not born prior to 1968, but uh, that, that was my senior year in high school. And I remember um, having to call an ambulance uh, for a family member in my household before there was 911. It hasn't always been with us. And ne neither has EMS always been with us. And if you, if you read the history, it turns out, interestingly enough, that the police used to be the responders to health uh, calls prior to the late 60s into the 70s. And EMS is a relatively new, um, a new service. It's an essential one. The first emergency medicine residency, it was, I, um, I, I, I read, only began in 1970. And interestingly enough, it was in Cincinnati, Ohio. Go so, cats. Yeah, go, go Cincinnati. Um, around the country today, emergency psychiatry fellowships are now emerging. As far as I know, we don't have any yet in Ohio. And I think we ought to think about whether there's a way to uh, stimulate the development of, of such fellowships. I think they could be very helpful uh, as we develop the, the crisis response system in our state. So the point I'm making is that the roadmap leads to uh, what I'll call a long trail. It, it's, this is not quick work, it's gonna take time. Um, I think Ken at the start laid it out really nicely that, that the ideal system is an aspiration to, to strive for. And when you have an aspiration like that, uh, it's, 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 it's easy to get impatient and say, well, we're, we're not there yet, so we have to give up. That's not what we need to do. We need to take it a step at a time, one step at a time. and um, and, and be patient and thoughtful. And, um, and right now we've got this great opportunity of developing the 988 call line. And um, 
I think we need to take advantage of that. But I think this is not easy work. I think because the mental health, spe the specialty mental health system and, and the overall health system uh, are, are uh, distinct, it may actually be harder to get to where uh, the mental health emergency response system has gotten in 50 years than it is in our world, but not a reason to give up, not a reason not to try. So I have three specific recommendations and then I will be done and, and we can, um, you can get your questions answered uh, from Margie and Ken and from me if you have any. Um, and I don't think any of these will be a surprise based on what I've said. I, I think the Adams board should be empowered as the accountable entities. Uh, perhaps an argument can, made that, can be made that there's a, a better different uh, such entity. Um, and if that's the case, that's fine. But to me, we, we've got this structure already in place. I think this, the chief clinical officer of that board should be or should designate who the crisis system coordinator should be. And I think, I think that person needs to be a clinical person who can respond to the complex cross system needs of emergency departments and inpatient units at hospitals and the like, supported by an administrative counterpart. I hope that as we develop the 988 response that it's um, done in close uh, concert with 911. Ideally, as, as we hear they're doing in, in um, Arizona, co-located at least in part. Um, I'm, I'm concerned when I hear that this might be a state level pro project because I think uh, obviously state level leadership is critically needed, but um, where the rubber meets the road, I think is at the local level and in this, dispatch and calling centers uh, where 911 and crisis response staff can be um, working in concert. In the same way that mobile crisis and CIT must work closely together, which they're doing or organically across the state. And then not surprisingly, I'm arguing we, we need a crisis response system coordinating center of excellence to support this challenging community level work. Not to, not to, to have input at the state level, but more to the point to help the local communities at the counties and board level to um, maintain their work and create learning communities across the, uh, the regions and, uh, uh, and keep the effort going over the long haul. I'm gonna stop there and uh, turn it back over to, to Rick, I think, who's gonna moderate some Mark. Money. No, thanks, Marco. Appreciate it. Um, so what we'll do now is I think we're going to go to a pa panel and maybe we'll hit a couple of the questions. And just as a quick review, like highlights, I know, and it seems like a long time ago and a lot of information ago that Dr. Minkoff spoke. But one of the highlights for me was sort of that always think about this long term vision, ideal system, not just like a shiny object in front of us that we got to implement and, and then feel good about it. Um, along with a lot of other stuff you shared. And then, you know, for, for Margie, I felt sort of this collaborative, collaborative data-driven accountability is what we seek and that the least restrictive, restrictive equals the least costly. And with data, you can actually demonstrate those cost savings that then motivate payers, motivate um, uh, taxpayers and legislatures to, to, to fund things differently. And then, you know, I think you all said, and Mark, you highlighted it there too, that, um, took 50 years for us to get the emergency medical response system to where it is. So we shouldn't expect that uh, one year from now when 988 is air quotes up and running that then somehow we've got it all figured out. That this is a much longer um, pursuit that, that we're in. And that we shouldn't also, I mean, I guess this is maybe Rick's opinion. We shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of good. And a couple of the questions that came in was, uh, had to do with state leadership or state Ohio legislatures. And, and I know that for us as a foundation, I, I'll speak, I'll, I'll say what I know. Um, we hosted, Governor DeWine hosted a meeting with Director Chris, Director Stickgraff, Director Annette Chambers-Smith, um, some associations, advocacy groups, probably about two dozen folks in the room for about two hours. Uh, the governor didn't say for the whole meeting, but it was all about how do we build a partnership and create everything we just talked about today. Not in this level of specificity, but there was an emphasis there. And then obviously the pandemic came about and, and some of this work has been delayed, but, but behind the scenes, um, national foundations such as Pew Trust, ourselves, others across the state, um, leadership at OMAS, Director Chris, um, Alicia Clark, who's on with us today, 
Um, there's a lot of work that's a lot of progress that's been made in, um, during the pandemic in this space, though I don't think a lot of folks know that. And, and I will say my perspective, and, and I'll tell you this too, I'm an umpire behind the plate. If I didn't think that our state government was leaning in, I represent the folks that suffer and the families that suffer these the consequences of this stuff. Um, so if I felt that, I wouldn't say this if it wasn't true, I guess is what I'm saying. And, and I'm grateful for um, what, what, what what's in front of us. Um, and, 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 the, and I also feel that in Ohio, so many folks across the nation are looking at us as all the things that you heard Mark talk about are the blocking and tackling for us to create this next level of impact in the space. So I'm excited for the future. Um, so if we could, and let's try and like, if and there's a lot to talk about, but I kind of want to ask this question, like, hey, so Ohio's into this work. Um, Margie, Margie, what's one dumb thing that you all did in Arizona that you wouldn't do so that like, we shouldn't do it? Like, give us a hint as, and, and maybe that maybe even at the county or community level, um, an example of like, hey, avoid this problem or avoid this hurdle. There's so many. Um, I think um, when they went from one single payer for all of behavioral health to multiples, they kind of forgot about crisis until the last minute. Um, and so like we've got these multiple managed care organizations and we were fortunate that our regional behavioral health authority stepped up to say, look, we've built this infrastructure for, you know, here's how your clinics can get on the list for the crisis mobile, you know, for the hotline to make appointments with you. And here's how, um, you know, if you make your process this way, it will match ours. And therefore you can use our process to send people out to enroll people. Like they didn't have to do that. You know, they, and the, and, and luckily down in Tucson, we only had three in Phoenix, they have like seven MCOs. So um, like that just happened because people are nice down here, but going forward, I think contracts with the state that if you're gonna have multiple managed care agencies, there needs to be something in there about how they work together and how they use common protocols and stuff like that. Um, ideally, you would want one of them that's or, you know, one of them that's responsible for crisis. Um, but because if everyone's responsible, then no one's responsible. So I think that that's a big one. So Rick, can I can I answer Please, this yeah. question as well? Um, although not from a, uh, just from having seen other systems. So so one of the things that I mean, having listened to Margie um, present and agreeing with you that she is definitely the coolest. Um, um, one of the things that's really important is there's something that Margie never says that it's really important to get across to people. Margie never says, well, in Pima County, we decided to go look at a model in Illinois and imitate it. She never says that. She says, we figured out how to sit down with ourselves in the true Arizona fashion. And we knew we had lots of problems and we figured out how to solve those damn things on our own. It's not that we weren't open to getting external advice, and using what we could learn from around the world. But we knew that what we had to do in Pima County was to develop something that worked for Pima County. And Pima County is going to be different than Maricopa County and different than Prescott and blah, blah, blah. And it is so tempting because we know this Margie hosts these people from all over the country. She says, hey, I want your crisis center. Can we get one? And what Margie will always tell you, and it's really hard, is, well, you can have something, but it has to be the thing that works in your system. And it may not look like what we've got, but what you have to have is a way of solving problems, okay? That's what's really important. And so shifting, what Mark said about the collaborations is a great place to start. And uh, I would say I agree totally that the um, Adams boards are the great starting place. 
to at least be empowered to be the convener in the process of developing the accountable entity. But you want to make sure that you're holding the door open for people who wouldn't show up at, uh, if they thought that the Adams board in their county was going to be in control of everything just based on whatever. And you want to shoot high. So when you say hospitals, you don't want the nurse in the ER. You want the CEO of your health system at the table. You want your county commissioners, your county executive, your your sheriff, your police chief. You don't want the CIT coordinator who's a corporal or a a sergeant. You need people who have authority and then they can connect and support the people who are going to be on the ground detailed problem solvers but you need to shoot high in the beginning. The third thing, which is what Margie is talking about, what Ohio and most states have already done, is to understand what you have the right to expect and should expect from any payer with whom there is contracting relationship, whether it's through managed care and Medicaid or through your division of insurance, which oversees whatever your commercial plans are required to do, however that works in Ohio. But there's this, One of the reasons that you get the kind of system that you do is because somebody thinks it's a great idea for people to have choice of plans, right? So that like somehow you're on a Medicaid person and you've got behavioral health needs and you're homeless. And the thing that really keeps you up at night is wishing that you could have a choice of your health plan because, oh my goodness, and you're going to read all the little brochures or whatever. But people get really attached to this, like somehow it's American to have choice. But we have to remember where choice is appropriate and where it isn't. So when you call 911, you don't get a little message saying, say one, if you choose ambulance plan A, two, if you choose ambulance plan B, you know, we want one system that responds to everybody. So whatever payers you have operating at the local level, they are responsible and accountable. They have to be. They're not now. For if the Adams board is convening, they have to show up and they have to show up with the right people. They have to show up with the intent to contribute. And that's something that's a piece of accountability. Before they, you're even asking them to spend anything, you're asking them to show up and be part of the solution. And so most states don't do that until way later. And then it gets to be much harder as Arizona is discovering. But those are things I would put in front of you guys right now. Thanks, Ken. So there, there was a couple questions about, um, well, one is the impact of telehealth as an expansion within the crisis system. And is there any experience in Arizona um, regarding that? And then another one had to do with did you, were there, were there issues with multiple certifications or like, hey, we're doing this basket of services versus more, a more narrow, narrowly defined set and were there challenges there? Yeah, so for, for telehealth, yeah, during COVID, um, like everywhere, telehealth kind of expanded and Arizona made it so that um, telehealth visits as well as phone visits um, would reimburse at the same rate. For crisis, um, we didn't use that much telehealth because, I mean, people are coming in acutely agitated. I mean, it's like the ER, like you kind of have to have the staff there. We had a few of our uh, physicians who have their own health issues that put them at high risk. And so like we had one of them cover the inpatient unit via, via telemed, but for the most part, everything was in person in the crisis center. Um, we also have, which I didn't talk about, is some outpatient clinics. And their, um, op- their opiate clinics, methadone clinics, and their um, telem- telehealth was hugely um, utilized, kind of like what we saw in all of outpatient mental health. Um, and you know the no-show rates like plummeted, which also begs the question how much of non-compliance of our patients is barriers to access. Um, and then, the question about the licenses and stuff. So um, one thing that Arizona has done, which I'm grateful for, is long before I moved here, they integrated mental health and substance use. So I oftentimes even forget to say that we're doing fully integrated mental health and substance use because it's not something I ever have to think about. If someone comes in and they're suicidal, 
then we treat them. If they need detox, then we treat them. If they're suicidal and they need detox, then we treat them. And we don't need like separate licenses to do all of that. I think when I mean, we added detox to our license, but it's not like, you know, some places it's like, well, you have to have a separate entrance if they're coming for the substance use and that. We don't have to do that. Um, also, when they were doing this whole like march towards integrating all the health plans, they made all the licensing integrated too. So we are licensed outpatient and the license type is integrated clinic. Um, so, you know, we could do minor medical stuff in there. And we have, we've experimented with that before. Um, but, and then there's, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's not as huge deal here to be able to fluctuate between those things. And also the way the funding goes, which I didn't kind of touch on is, at the front end, we don't have to worry about any of that, which is super nice. Um, the money's all braided in, in a big lump. And then like we get a payment every month of, you know, it's a set amount. And then we have to show, like we basically have to submit claims against that um, and show that we earned a percentage of what they're giving us. And then on the, and everyone in Arizona is, everyone who finds themselves experiencing a crisis in the state of Arizona whether they live here or not, or documented or, or whatever, they're entitled to the to crisis services. And on the back end, um, then when the REBA is is like you know doing all of its accounting, they'll go, okay, you sent us claims for these two hundred people, and they had Medicaid, so we're going to put these billing codes that you did for these people, we're gonna allocate that to the Medicaid pot. And these 20 people didn't have Medicaid, but they're eligible under the mental health block grant. And then these people didn't have anything. So they're gonna go under that state line item for crisis. And so all that happens on the back end. So we don't have to worry and you know do all of the stuff on the front end to determine if they have funding before we serve them. And then just to make the point about the private insurers, and so you go through all that. If you have Blue Cross Blue Shield, at the end of the day, all of your, you know, to call the crisis line and the mobile team comes and sees you and then you come and see us and stay overnight with us and we get you taken care of. Uh, the line item for indigent care pays for the Blue Cross person because they are unfunded. Which is wrong. Which is wrong. But it's true. They'll build, yeah, we can build a professional fee, the 9,000 code. But other than that, it all comes out of indigent stuff. Gotcha, Margie. That, no, that's helpful. I, I think that's one of the things that we seek in our state is to, as we tool this, demonstrate that least restrictive means least costly, which then can create policy change or a policy roadmap to say, okay, hey, let's, let's, let's look at differently how we reimburse for care because at the end of the day, there's better outcomes for less money, which is yeah. my theory on what can happen in all this space. Mark, Ooh. if you could, or, or any of you mentioned quickly too, like I think one of the challenges we do see coming as well is that as we think about different roles, responsibilities for individuals and professionals in this space, um, role appears and all that kind of stuff that is there or do we predict that there's a workforce gap that we need in order to really the ideal crisis system or the ideal behavior health system, could we staff it if we had it today? Uh, how do you think about what we need to do in that in order to have the right folks doing the right jobs at the, in, in, soon enough? Well, all of mental health has workforce issues. Um, one thing that I think could be done easily and would match with all of the federal strategy around crisis is to make the, um, HRSA has the uh, National Health Service Corps where you get your loans repaid if you work in certain settings. But, and I, it's been my white whale ever since I started here. They will not approve a crisis setting because it's not a longitudinal clinic where you're their health home forever. So if they would make crisis work eligible for loan repayment, that would be nice. The other, you know, thing is to, um, you know, we have residents who rotate with us. Most residencies don't have exposure to stuff like this. The best way to recruit workforce is to, you know, get them trained the way you want them before they graduate and then recruit them. So um, yeah. and, and that's and also 
uh, and challenge. I would add, yeah. add that it's it's part of the reason for making these settings fun mm. and successful with ad ad adequate staffing and good leadership as opposed to torturing people, you know, and putting people, their exposure is to horrible situations where they get the proximate trauma of what's being done to the people and then they never want to be in that situation ever again. And so there's a, a, um, an alignment between what we want to produce for the people we're serving and what we want to produce for the people serving them. And Margie's place is fabulous at that. I mean, Margie gets a lot of credit for the fact that it is, but people have fun. I mean, crisis work isn't easy, but it's the most beautiful, rewarding, exciting work ever. But you, everybody has to design it like it's as important as it actually is so that people really feel attracted to it. Thanks, Ken. Real quick, Mark, anything you want to add? And we're well, the point I made about um, emergency psychiatry fellowships, we've worked hard in Ohio to integrate our psychiatry residents in, in, into the um, public mental health system and including in, in, a, in a number of communities where they have something akin to a, to a freestanding crisis center. And I think that is a, uh, a rotation that residents enjoy. And, um, and then if, if that could be followed by uh, additional training, we could start creating the, the workshop, at least the psychiatric workforce. Um, yeah, and, and um, like I'm on the American Association for Emergency Psychiatry has been having some discussions with this. And I think you could make a really cool fellowship that it's not just about seeing consults in the ER, you know, psych consults in the ER. Like you want people at these, these specialized crisis centers, but then also the way like emergency medicine has EMS fellowships where you're doing all this pre-hospital stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having fellowships that help develop people to be like the, you know, the behavior health medical director for the fire department or for the mobile teams and stuff like that. There's right. a huge, like, fun stuff that people don't think about could be part rolled into that. Awesome. Thanks, Margie. I know we're coming up on time. So I'm just grateful to all the panelists, three great friends and colleagues in this effort. Um, uh, grateful to uh, the folks at OMAS, Director Chris for coming today, um, our friends at OACBA and, and uh, Recovery Ohio. Uh, thank you, Courtney, for herding the cats and getting us all together here. And with that, I want to uh, thank everybody and turn it over to Alicia, if I could. Yes, I just want to echo Rick's sentiments. Thank you, everybody, for a wonderful Crisis Academy. The slides will be posted on our website in the next couple of weeks. And if